I guess we should go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, the slides are posted on the Scrubs page and Lindsay at Dog Mom DES. I will share my screen. So the agenda is we will go through pulmonary first. Um, then we'll take a nice break and then we'll uh, go through the renal stuff. So just want to remind you guys of a few things. So on the Scrubs page, um, if you see the about me section, if you're looking for the playlist, you can, the links are there. All you have to do is go there and bookmark it. If you bookmark that playlist, because if you subscribe to the channel, the, the, these uh, videos are private. So you need to use the playlist, bookmark it, and then you can get to all of it. If you want to go ahead and start looking next term, uh, maybe that's a good thing to do over the break, just like passively watch some of our reviews for term two. Uh, there's a link to the term two playlist as well. So maybe do that. I don't know, on an airplane, whatever, um, if you want to get productive. <laughs> but um, yeah, so use the playlist. All the links are there. All will be good to go. All right. So Lindsay is going to uh, do some fun stuff, some lymphatics with you guys. And um, I'll man the chat in the meantime. Okay, so lymph, this is a big thing. Now you guys did, I think I saw in some of your chats, you, what happened to you is the same thing that happened to the current term twos where they tested you on lymph, even though you weren't given lymph, is that, is that correct? Because this stuff was actually on our CPR one exam, but they moved it to your CPR two. Is that correct? You can tell me in the chat, yes or no. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the lymph system, there will be a handful of questions on your exam for this. Um, it, it, you need to get a good understanding about this now. So it's divided into cells and organs. Cells, you have the T lymphocytes, NK, which are natural killers, B lymphocytes, and antigen presenting cells. Organs, you have primary, bone marrow, and thymus. The primary means that these are where these mature. So the B cells mature in the bone marrow, the T cells mature in the thymus. And then the secondary, these are where they circulate through when they leave the bone marrow and the thymus. And so spleen, tonsils, lymph nodes, diffuse lymphatic tissue, and then lymph, lymphatic nodules. And the secondary um, sites are also where they're going to be presented with antigen and stuff like that. But for term one right now, you just need to be able to identify um, them and differentiate them. Oh, did you skip a slide, Brady? There we go. So the differences between them, T lymphocytes, differentiate in the thymus, T, T cells, thymus, T and T, that's easy. Um, they have receptors that recognize antigen, they, which is an MHC molecule. Yes, you need to know MHC1 versus MHC2, but we'll get to that in a sec. So T helper, they recognize the antigens on the antigen presenting cells. They synthesize interleukins, um, CD4. T, there are two um, subsets, T helper ones, T helpers twos, T helper one controls intracellular, T helper two, these are going to be extracellular pathogens. And then you have a cytotoxic lymphocytes, which are going to recognize antigen on cells infected with cancer and viral particles. You need to know the difference between these three. So intracellular versus extracellular versus viral particles, cancer and viral particles. Yes, that is important because each cell is going to be responsible for a different thing. Um, I put all these CDs down here and they list them in your notes. I believe a couple of them are bolded. I would recognize which are associated with the T versus B versus the NK. Okay, let me see if I can do a pointer options pointer. Okay, I don't know how. I don't think I can do a pointer because I'm not the presenter. Anybody uh, know? You can annotate, right? Can you? And you can yeah, I can annotate. Okay, let's do an, let's annotate. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay, but I would definitely know the different CDs because they can um, test you on that on our exam. And then B lymphocytes, this is humoral immunity. 
um, antigen binding. So the humoral immunity, this means that you're building up antibodies to something. Um, and then plasma cells, memory B, of course, the CDs, you need to know um, which CDs are associated. Natural killer cells, this is innate immunity, meaning that it is going to happen without your body having to do anything. They just, they're there and they can go and um, kill cells. They release- are you Sorry, are you annotating? No, because- Oh, sorry. I, I was just, okay, I was, it sounded like you were. I didn't know because it's not showing up. Sorry. Oh, no. Um, so they release granzymes and perforins. That's how they do their thing. Um, FC receptors, they lyse cells coded by um, IgG or complement and then the CDs. And then the antigen presenting cells, these are macrophages. Um, they process and present antigens on the surface. This is probably like one of the bigger jobs of the immune system. So MHC2 and MHC1, the reason, the way I remember the difference between these two is because um, it takes like two like lines to form a four and like one line to form an eight. I know it's really simple and corny, but that's how I remember that MHC2 is associated with CD4s and MHC1 is associated with CD8. So it's corny, it's weird, but it works because I remember it all the time. Um, but you do need to know the difference between those two. You will get a question on it on the exam. And then um, I do remember a question about Kupfer versus Langerhans versus dendritic. Um, these are just um, macrophages in different areas of the body. And so they get it, give it a different name. So Kupfer cells, liver, Langeron cells in the skin. So I would be familiar with those different names. So two or three questions on this slide. Um, um, this is just a very, very, very brief overview of the immune system. You can go, Brady. So question, please private message Brady or myself with your answer. We'll give you about 30 seconds. Yeah, you guys are getting this. Yeah. So you guys are getting this right. We just talked about this. This is cytotox cytotoxic lymphocyte. So it's um, cytotoxic T cells. So they're going to be responsible for viral infected cells. Yeah, you guys are getting this one too. Okay, we can move on. It's the NK cells. Some people are um, choosing D. So most people are choosing B, but some people are choosing D. It's not macrophages, macrophages because macrophages are going to phagocytize anything, which means it kind of takes it in and it eats it and it degrades it inside. And so when it degrades it inside, it um, actually puts them on an MHC1 or MHC2 to present it to um, T lymphocytes. And so they don't actually have a huge role in the immune killing. They'll phagocytize and they have um, a, a role in immune responses. So they go and talk to the T lymphocytes, but the NK cells, remember those are killer cells. Those are going to go and they're going to find something that's been opsonized and they're going to um, release their granzymes and perforins, which are going to um, induce the apoptosis like down the line. But um, though those are the NK cells. Normal BP for kids, I don't know, it's not really important for, um, it's a little higher than one, 120 over 80. It's about the same for all intents and purposes. The only thing like yeah. neonates, their heart rates, it's much, uh, much higher in, in fetus, but it's about the same. Mm -hmm.
there's kind of an even split right now between two answer choices. Okay, you can show the answer, Brady. Macrophage. So just um, be aware of those identifications. Okay, organs, please, please, please know how to differentiate the different organs. Um, I am going to help you with that right now to be able to tell the difference. Now, lymphatic tissue, uh, I kind of got um, carried away with the slides and making them pretty. So <laughs> some of them have this little gradient right here. So I apologize, but I'm going to tell you the different um, forms that um, the different ways you can tell the difference between them. So lymphatic tissue, this is non-encapsulated localized accumulation of immune cells. So you, so malt and galt, so mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, and then um, I think it's GI associated, get GIT associated lymphoid tissue. So walls of GI, rest, and GU. So this is basically anywhere that um, has mucosal lining or um, it's exposed to the outside. And so you need a little more protection of stuff that can get through. So you'll see, so you'll see that this is just an accumulation of cells, but there's no thick capsule. So this is where I need to start annotating. There is no thick capsule around it. It's just an accumulation of cells right here. That's the biggest thing. Okay, you can go to the next one. Okay, the thymus. Remember, this is a really important one because this is where you are going to um, have the T cells, I'm sure. So it's no afferent lymphatics. That was a very important fact. No afferent lymphatics. The capillaries are continuous. It's from the third pouch. And then here you do have a capsule and then um, with, uh, connective tissue extensions called trabeculae that divide the tissue into lobules. So what I mean by that are these, these are your connective tissue capsule that divides into the different lobules. Now you have a cortex, so immature T lymphocytes. You also have the ERCs that provide support and surround the vasculature to form the blood thymus barrier. So we're sequestering this. Why do we want to sequester this right, sequester this right now? You're going to get into this in a lot in term three. So, so it's not super, super important. But the reason is you do not want the immature T lymphocytes to be presented with antigen at this time because then a lot of stuff can go wrong because immature T lymphocytes don't have a lot of specificity and some of them might be pathological in the sense that they are going to have overreactivity or underreactivity. And so you want to make sure that they are in a sterile area to go through the process to be mature lymphocytes. So you've weeded out all of the bad ones. You've weeded out all of the bad eggs. And so you want this to be completely walled off. And how does that happen? It's the epithelial reticular cells um, that are going to protect that. And then you have mature T cells that migrate into the medulla. So, you know, your cortex is out here. That's the dark staining part. And then they're going to migrate into the medulla via um into medullary blood vessels, afferent lymphatics. So in the medulla, this is your mature T lymphocytes. So at this point, you have weeded out all of the bad eggs, all of the eggs that are going to overreact and maybe cause a hypersensitivity or underreact and they're not gonna work. And so you've weeded everything out. Now you can go and you can actually get into some of the good stuff. So mature T, T lymphocytes, degenerating ERCs, of course, we don't really need the ERCs anymore because they're help forming that barrier. And then the degenerating ERCs are going to form Hassel's corpuscles, and they are not going to surround those medullary blood vessels again for 
what we just talked about. So thymus, make sure you are looking for that connective tissue um, capsule extensions. These are your trabeculae and they are going to, um, I mean, this is just how it's cut right here. This is going to help you identify the thymus. And then you are going to have these large lobules with a thick, dark cortex and inner medulla. So make sure you can tell the difference between that. Now, lymph nodes, these are very, very important because they are going to filter blood and identify and fight infection. So this is how you are going to do the like main infection um, findings. And um, now you, you talked about this in MSK, but I want to reiterate this here. Anytime that SGU talks about lymph, something filtering lymph, you need to pay attention to that. And especially in pulmonary, and Brady will probably get into this in his part, but um, the pulmonary lymph is a little confusing with the hyalur nodes and everything like that. So just make sure that you are familiar with the different um, lymph drainages for this system, for any system that SGU points out. But this filters lymph, um, it enters via an afferent lymph and drains into the cortex um, via the subcapsular sinuses, trabecular sinuses. You do need to know this pathway. Um, because they might ask you a part of the pathway. Outer cortex, B lymphocytes, paracortex, or T, and then they have the high endothelial ven venules and then the medulla. And so outer cortex, you see out here. And then as you move in, you're going to see, um, have the paracortex and then the medulla is going to be down here. And so you'll see this isn't as lobulated as the thymus was. You have a lot of these medullary centers, but you don't have that thick, thick cortex that you, um, in the trabeculations like you did with the thymus. And then the spleen, this filters blood, your red pulp and white pulp. Red pulp is the network of reticular fibers and the filtration of antigen. Um, and then the white pulp is an accumulation of lymphocytes. And you can see the central artery surrounding, surrounded by an inner layer of T cells and a layer of B cells. This is how you tell that this is the spleen. So you have these areas of white pulp and you have the central arteries here. So if you see this pattern, you know you're in the spleen. And also look at the color. And I mean, hopefully the colors on the exam are going to be um, good. We all know that sometimes the quality isn't the best. So um, if you can't tell, because this seems really, really red, the spleen histo is usually really dark like this. But if the color quality do doesn't come out, the way you can tell is you have these er the con areas of condensation with a central arterial, um, center central artery in the middle of the section. So that's how you can identify it. And it's not going to be as um, as organized as say the thymus or the um, even the lymph nodes with those nodules up um, by the cortex. So that's how you tell the different. And so these are going to be kind of interspersed throughout the spleen. And that's how you're going to be able to tell that's the spleen. Um, so the tonsils up here, pharyngeal tonsil, posterior pharyngeal wall. Um, you guys can read this, but the biggest thing, oral part, there was something I wanted to point out here. I don't remember. Oh yeah. So a lymphoid aggregates at the base of each crib. So say with mucous guts. I don't actually remember what I was trying to point out here. Brady, do you remember the biggest thing here? Didn't, did you not have, um, were there more slides on this with the, I don't, I did go too far forward and shoot, showed the answer to the next one. Um, yeah, the crypts are important. Um, yeah, this is it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, knowing the difference, like which ones have the longer crypts versus the shorter crypts and stuff like that, that'll be able to, you'll be able, that's all you really need to pay attention to. Oh, this that. is. But no, we the, could do, oh. 
I don't think that was associated with that. What is this? Um, I know what that is. Okay. <laughs> I just talked about it. This this is all the lymph tissue. All right. Okay. But, yeah. Um, but so some of the tonsils have. Um, uh, I could pull up. I'll pull up the the slides real quick, and we can look at them while you uh, while they do this question. I'll try to find it. Those um that slide before there was maybe like uh, one question on it, maybe. Oh. Yeah, everybody's getting this right. I hope everybody gets this right. What's this disease? What is it called? Yes, to George, to George. So the biggest thing that they like to test you on is the hypoplasia of the thymus. And the thymus, of course, is the site of maturation of the T lymphocytes. So that's good. That'll keep coming back. What, what lecture did y'all do, the, um, the tonsils? I'm just looking for it. Yeah, I cast did, did we not do this in, uh, when did we do this? Y'all remember the name of that lecture? It was an hour CPR one, Brady. Oh, okay. Never mind. I'll find it. Okay, thank you. I found it. All right. um, so I have a lot of abbreviations in here. Thirty-year-old female presents the ED via EMS from the site of a motor vehicle collision in which she was a strained driver. Um, she is complaining of pain to her left upper quadrant, left chest wall, and left upper extremity. Diaphoretic and has marked left upper quadrant abdominal pain. Sonof. Okay, that's all. Okay, yeah, you guys are getting this. Yep, B, which is the spleen. So what are A, C, and D real quick in the chat? Hopefully D is really obvious because you have those really thick trabeculations. Yeah, A is gonna be the um, diffuse lymphatic tissue. D is the thymus and C is a lymph node, yeah. Great job, great job. Let me share this real quick. All right, this was from our lecture. Um, the main thing I wanted to point out uh, that you could see like the some of the differences here, like the capsule, you could appreciate the capsule here, but um, some of the crypts like the, the here, you could see these deep crypts, these tonsillar crypts. Also these nodules are very characteristic for the lymph nodes too. So I imagine the, um, the questions that they'll give you or the images will look very similar to this. But if you see these aggregates, they, they, there are aggregates in the spleen and some in the lymph node as well. But these are very characteristic because you could see these log crypts, right? Now, if you compare that to um, the lingual tonsils, you could see it's more of a shallow crypt. Um, but again, this is obviously a more zoomed in view, but um, you can see these nodules here, right? So those are little uh, lymphoid aggregates. So being able to, to appreciate the capsule, see the nodules, and even not just um, being able to recognize it, but if they tell you on the exam, um, you're just looking at, you know, in the question, it's a deep crypt or it's a shallow crypt, like being able to differentiate those, that's basically the only difference between them. So um, that's really all you could go with. Um, for this, D is actually the thymus here. You see those um, trabeculations, the thick um, connective tissue trabeculations, and then the like cortex and the medulla for the right. lobe. So you could see the common theme here that they, these all have nodules, right? That's all these aggregates of lymphoid where that you bring the antigens or the toxins, whatnot in that you can uh, complex with the, the uh, the B, the B and T cells, but just make sure you could differentiate those. So the, the, um, the tonsils have longer crypts and the, the little aggregates go along them. All right. 
Great. Let's go on to uh, some more of the physiology type stuff. All right. So, uh, as you know, we typically breathing doesn't take much effort, right? So um, the act of breathing in, you have your principal muscles, just the, uh, the, the intercostal muscles, but primarily just the diaphragm. This is quiet breathing or normal breathing. But sometimes um, if you have to, you know, if you're breathing heavily, if you're working out or whatnot, you use accessory muscles like your sternocleidomastoid or the scalenes, right? When you take deep breaths. So um, that's kind of the idea um, if you're on the test and you can't remember, just like start breathing heavily and see what extra muscles you use and use it to your advantage. You might get flagged, don't blame me. Um, but but um, expiration, when you breathe out, it's a reflexive process, right? So the act of breathing in opens your thoracic cage, but when you uh, breathe out, it's, um, it's more of a passive process, right? So it's just gonna recoil down, that's quiet breathing. Um, these accessory muscles, uh, you know, um, it's, especially your abdominals are what is you're gonna use um, uh, when you have to breathe out forcefully, okay? So um, that's one of the key things you want to uh, note there. And then this is just it in words. Hold on one of you, yeah, sorry. Um, that's the same thing in words. Now they really like this for whatever reason. Um, so just make sure you can make sense of this. The primary process of breathing again is your diaphragm, right? You contract your diaphragm so it'll go down. So that puts a negative pressure in your thorax, meaning it's a suction, right? So your, your diaphragm contracts down, you're able to breathe, breathe in. When your diaphragm relaxes, it kind of goes up and you breathe out, right? But they really like these, these um, process or what they call these different movements. The pump handle movement is just your anterior posterior movement, right? So it's, it's your sternum rising up. Okay, so again, your diaphragm is gonna do most of the work, but when you take a deep breath in, this pump handle movement is just in the direction uh, of your thorax going up a little bit. Also the bucket handle, think of a bucket handle goes to both sides, right? So this is the, the lateral um, uh, expansion of your, of your rib cage. But after you do that, again, exhaling is more of a passive process where everything goes back to normal. Um, so the, uh, the visceral pleura, you don't have any fibers and you can see, or, or sorry, any visceral fibers. <clears throat> so you don't feel any pain there. Um, and you can see that in yellow here. So if you had uh, like a collapsed lung or whatnot, um, you could see here, that's kind of what it would look like. And you'd have, you could have blood or you could have air in this peritoneal space, this, um, uh, this parietal space, excuse me. Now the fibers that you do feel, so remember visceral is always on the organ and then parietal kind of lines the outside of it. Um, so what, what you do feel is uh, fibers on this parietal pleura, okay? So when you have some sort of pathology there, some sort of friction rub, uh, you tend to be able to feel it. A lot of those fibers in the parietal pleura are somatic too, so it's pinpoint touch. Whenever you're trying to differentiate whether it's visceral pain versus, or even if you're asking your patient, visceral pain versus somatic pain, right? You could say, can you, can, you, can you feel the pain or can you point to the pain with one finger, right? That tends to mean it's somatic, right? It, you, whereas visceral pain is more of like a diffuse pain, right? Like epigastric pain and, and stuff, but anything somatic or musculoskeletal, you tend to be able to point to it. So the point being is that when you feel this parietal pain or, the, uh, pain or this, this pleural fr friction rub is what they call it, they tend to be able to point to it. It's like this sharp pain. Um, but this is kind of just the layout that you're looking at. You can see the mediastinum in the middle. Obviously that contains your heart, right? And you see that there. Costal part, costal meaning ribs. That's gonna be innervated by your intercostal nerves. Diaphragmatic part, remember C, uh, C3, 4, and 5, keep the diaphragm alive. So remember that's gonna be coming off of the phrenic nerve. Okay. Um, I think we mentioned this when we did cardio, but they like this van arrangement too. So it's van as in vein artery nerve. So um, just some, you, you know, you need to be able to point this out on the exam. So the van runs inferior to the superior rib, okay, in this complex here, right? So this is the, of these two, this is the superior rib. The van runs inferior to the superior rib. Okay, that's probably how they'll talk about it. So if you were gonna do some sort of thoracocentesis, you want to insert the needle 
superior to the inferior rib down here, right? You're trying to miss this bundle here, right? This pain fibers and this blood supply. So uh, make sure you know the difference, where it lies, and also where you want to stick the needle in. All right, and this is, I put this in here more for completeness sake. Uh, the point here is if you have some sort of ischemia or some sort of trauma to an area, uh, you, you tend to have um, uh, accessory fibers or um, uh, what's it called? Uh, anastomoses, right, that come around uh, that are able to give blood supply. So you're able to do it that way. But primarily, a lot of these intercostal fibers come directly off of the aorta. You have some that run on the sternum. You probably should know kind of the pathway, right? So it goes from intercostals um, here, but you can see the muscular front, it goes to the superior epigastric, probably, uh, you know, more low yield, but it's good to know. Same thing for the venous drainage. Again, you're gonna try to, anything that's coming from the legs, um, you're gonna try to uh, get up through the zygous vein, um, through this system. Uh, remember, I mean, anything that comes from the gut has to be filtered through the, the liver, but um, everything coming from the legs that doesn't need to be filtered, you get up through through the zygous vein. And then after, the, after all of the, um, the blood comes from the liver, it uh, also goes into the inferior vena cava and then drains into the heart. So, uh, and then also, again, this is more for completeness sake, but you could see the, um, uh, the lymphatic ducts, right? The thoracic duct is what drains directly into the, um, uh, it's to the uh, suprascapular, I believe, right up here. Um, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's the suprascapular right, uh, right there. And then uh, the, the right side has its own drainage points too. Um, okay, try this one. Subclavian, sorry, it drains into the subclavian. That's what it is, not superscapular, sorry. It was a late night in my, just, I don't want to talk about it, but I'm just letting y'all know. We're here for you guys, all right? <laughs> yeah, so, um, right, uh, incomplete division of the foregut. And you could see here, so this is what they like to talk. I don't like that picture, um, this picture here, but yeah, you have this uh, laryngotracheal groove and I'll show you what they're talking about here. So um, when you uh, divide it to the larynx and trachea, obviously they have to be separated because the trachea is where the air is gonna go. And then um, the pharynx is going to uh, bring um, uh, food down into the esophagus. So uh, the, what they really like to talk about is one, you need to know this buds where this laryngotracheal groove because that's what ends up causing this pathology. Uh, you don't need to know the different ones. Um, the one that's most common is A, all right? So this is the presentation that they'll give. They'll say the child, uh, newborn child is, um, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, sorry, is there an image? Uh, no, so this goes with this, right? So th th so we can look at the question again. So right, uh, first feeding, his, his feedings, x-ray images shows, uh, so this was the one, remember, where I did it and I had it up, but I didn't actually attach it to the question. So yes, there's supposed to be an image. <laughs> oh, x-ray image is shown. That would help. Um, okay, but we'll, we can fix that later. This is what, what's going to end up happening, right? So um, shoot, if you could maybe pull it up, pull it, just pull one up real quick of the... Uh, um, uh, or, or I could do it later, it doesn't matter. So anyway, this is what's gonna happen, right? So first feedings, the child, uh, as soon as um, they ingest milk, they vomit it up, forceful vomiting, right? And what you see is that this is actually the esophagus, right? So um, so it's a blind ended pouch. So anything that there's literally nowhere for it to go. Uh, it's not stenotic, it's not narrow, it's, com it's, com it's a treasure, right? It's completely cut off. So there's nowhere for it to go. So the only thing you could do for this child is to 
uh, is to surgically repair it. Now, what, you'll, what else you'll note, and this is what would, would have been shown on the x-ray, is that because the lower end of the esophagus is attached to the trachea, you'll get a very large gastric bubble there. Okay, and that's just because some, most of the air is going to the lungs, but some is going to this aberrant pathway to the stomach, right? So you're gonna get a, a very large uh, um, gas bubble in the stomach. Um, but we'll, when we, uh, I'll, I'll correct it and we'll add it um, to the slides. So they really like testing this concept of surfactant. It's probably the most important thing in pulmonary, right? So the very important period is this canalicular period. Um, so what you wanna focus on is these type two alveolar cells, okay? These are going to be the cells that end up making surfactant. They start about week 20, and about week 26, the, the fetus is viable. The reason the fetus is viable is because of this surfactant. What you see is if you have premature, premature births um, and this surfactant isn't formed, these kids have respiratory distress syndrome and the, there's a problem and we'll get into the physiology of that. Um, but what you need to focus on is the fact that it's important for these type two pneumocytes or alveolar cells, these type two pneumocytes to make surfactant. And that's a, what's gonna help to hold the, the alveoli open. Um, all right, try to answer this one. Let's see, I'll pull up a picture for you guys of the x-ray of that, sorry. All right, let me see, what are we looking at here? Three packs, okay, lung cancer at the tip of the arrow. So basically they're asking you um, literally the histology to what is the function? So a second order question. And these are these type two pneumocytes. Um, let me stop real quick. I'll show you all this before I forget. All right, so this is a child with a tracheoesophageal fistula. You can appreciate like this, this area right here. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see it kind of looks blind ended right there. Um, what they did, if you see this little white piece, uh, they tried to insert um, a catheter down there. And you could see when they inserted it down, it, it came back up, right? Because it's blind ended, there's nowhere to go. But what's very, uh, very apparent is look at this gas bubble. Like that's normal. You do see a gas bubble, but this is huge, especially for that little baby, even though he's swallowing a little bit of, uh, or, or we all, even as a child, you know, you, you especially you're going to swallow a little bit of, um, of air when you're, when you're feeding, you know, that's why they you burp the baby. Um, but um, you could see that this, this gas bubble is a lot larger. And that is because um, that is because of this fistula, right? That we're looking at. So the air is coming in through here. Most of it goes to the lungs, but a lot of the extra air is going into um, the stomach. But what they what I was telling y'all is they they put try to put a cord down here or a little catheter and it just came back up. So that kind of told them um, you know, uh, that there was a, a tracheoesophageal fistula. So we'll add that picture when we uh, repost the slides for you guys. All right, so let's look at this. Now, what you're seeing here is the alveoli. This is a very thin layer that's very important because uh, you need that thin layer to be able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide both ways, right? What you see in smokers especially is this layer gets fibrotic. And so that's why uh, it's difficult for the air to pass through from the alveoli into the bloodstream. So what you're looking at here around here are these type one pneumocytes around here. And these larger ones that are kind of eosinophilic or clear staining are the type two pneumocytes. Type two pneumocytes, as we've stated, are gonna be uh, producing surfactant. So you can see here again, you see this big one. So if they ask you, um, this is a little tricky, but just if you follow around, you can kind of see these type ones. Um, but uh, the type twos tend to be at these branch points. You see these larger ones um, there. So it should be pretty straightforward. Um, you could read this uh, on your own, the main thing, 20 weeks, but 22 to 26. 26 is kind of the mark. You don't want to really um, 
uh, if you can avoid it, you don't want to uh, deliver the baby until then. Um, what they can do, they actually can give the mom corticosteroids <clears throat> and it actually helps to promote uh, surfactant um, um, synthesis in the child. So you can actually augment this process a little bit. Oh, here it is, yes, glucocorticoids, yes. So y'all do need to know that. <clears throat> All right, so what actually happens is, um, uh, and we talked about this in cardio, that whole, the whole idea of having this shunt system for the fetus is to avoid uh, the lungs, right? Because the lungs are not fully formed. Uh, and so the process of forming the lungs is that <clears throat> the child's gonna swallow fluid, amniotic fluid, and that's gonna help to, um, to develop the lungs over time. So what happens is if for some reason, oligo meaning not enough or a lip, you know, small amount of, of amniotic fluid, hydramnios, so not enough amniotic fluid is what they're saying here, whereas polyhydramnios is too much amniotic fluid. So oligo hydramnios means you don't have enough amniotic fluid. So what does that mean for the baby? Well, the baby doesn't have a not a lot, um, enough fluid to, to swallow, um, <clears throat> the lungs aren't gonna develop properly. So you're gonna get pulmonary hypoplasia. So one of the consequences of not having enough amniotic fluid is that the lungs aren't, aren't able to develop properly, okay? All right, so then they talked about hernias. This is more of a DM thing, um, but, oh, I know why, okay. Yeah, so you get these hernias, but yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, definitely no, like this picture, right? So, um, you know, the, the GI tract is, is uh, high pressure. So if you do have a hernia here, um, you can see the, the, um, the guts, the intestines actually came up through, uh, through the, the hernia, the, the diaphragmatic hernia. And you could see just like this picture has it, it's just like that here. And that's why you see this air filled space because that's the intestines that came up through there. So um, what does this mean? So like you're thinking, well, this is very much a DM problem, right? Why are we talking about it here? Well, the problem is if this happens, the lungs can't develop properly, right? If there's, um, if you have this, uh, this herniation through there, the, the baby's not gonna be, even as a fetus, is not gonna be able to, uh, you know, get that, that swallow that amniotic fluid and uh, develop the lungs. So this is a problem, uh, not just in DM, but um, for, um, <clears throat> for respiratory too. I think the important thing I wanted to point out in this slide is this, uh, just a buzzword for you, this pleural peritoneal membrane, okay? If that does not form properly, that is what's gonna allow the intestines to herniate through. So that's a very important buzzword for you guys. And again, I would uh, mark this, uh, this image here. You should be able to note that this obviously is not normal, right? Everything's pushed to the side. All right, so yeah, again, this is similar, like I was saying, to uh, oligohydramnios. Again, pulmonary hypoplasia. If you're gonna, uh, if all the lungs are gonna be pushed to the side, the baby's not gonna be able to swallow uh, the fluid, and you won't develop the um, the lungs. All right, so this is very similar, but it's the it's not the complete membrane. Okay, just the musculature is absent, so it's called an eventration. So what you see here is that membrane's still there but the lungs still, since there's no musculature of this pleuroperitoneal membrane, same buzzword, if there's no muscular, musculature there, um, the intestines are able to uh, kind of not, not herniate, but travel up through. So what they, said, what they say with this is they get, the child will get paroxysmal breathing, right? So where you would expect uh, the, the abdomen to come out when, uh, when you breathe in, it actually goes inward. And that's because that that pressure system brings the, the intestines up from the abdomen into the thorax. So that's why they talk about this paradoxical respiration here. But you should know, again, this is not just the pleuroperitoneal, I mean, I'm sorry, it's just the pleuroperitoneal musculature that's affected here, whereas the complete hernia or the hole is gonna be the musculature with the membrane, okay? So make sure you keep those separate. But again, same problem here, again, if you have this up in the, in the thorax, in the area of this thorax, the lungs are not gonna be able to develop properly. Okay, so this is just normal. So if you compare that to the tracheoesophageal fistula, you can see here, this gas bubble isn't as large. So this is more of a normal presentation um, uh, that you could see there. Um, okay, let's see. So, 
Right. Um, as you know, the Casa Diaphragmatic Recess, uh, we, again, we talked about this when we did a little bit of thorax, is kind of lower, right? So you can see this blue here is the pleural membrane or the, uh, yeah, and so uh, the lung actually ends here. So if there's any sort of fluid that develops, uh, you're gonna be able to uh, do a pleural tap there and get the fluid out. So it's a, like kind of a safe space to avoid the lung and get the fluid at the most dependent point. Um, right, that's where fluid is gonna develop at the costal diaphragmatic recess. And this is what you learned. So typically clinically, they'll use uh, the mid axillary line just because it's the most convenient place to do this. But you wanna remember these, um, these, 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 um, these areas, right? Six to eight, eight to 10, 10 to 12, right? Uh, so, uh, but ideally they go mid axillary around rib nine. But if you really wanted to go to the most dependent place, you would go paravertebral, right? But, you know, nobody wants a needle in the middle of their back. If you got to get it, uh, it's easier to do it mid axillary. All right, pneumothorax. Um, let's see. Oh, I see. Right. So, look. Um, Hopefully, yeah, if, if your brightness is up, I don't I think I don't think if I change the brightness on mine, it affects shelves. It's just gonna, yeah, I don't, right. Um, but you could kind of see the outline here um, that this lung has completely collapsed, right? Um, so this whole area, it's, it's a, if, you, if your brightness is up, uh, it's a little bit darker here than it is here. And that's because it's completely empty space. But you could see here that this complete lung has collapsed. So what you would expect is that the trachea should shift away from the uh, the um, uh, from the pneumothorax, right? That's way too bright. I need to turn it down now. All right, there we go. Um, right. So there's spontaneous pneumothorax. This tends to happen in uh, teenagers, um, it's like these uh, plural blebs, they call them. Sometimes they rupture and it could be spontaneous. The one you really need to be concerned with is this traumatic thing. So sometimes they talk about a knife wound. It's some sort of suction, right? So any so air is able to get in, but air is not able to get out, right? So eventually it's gonna push everything to the side and the lung could end up collapsing. So if you're trying, if, if this is tricky for you, what you need to do, again, this is always just standard. Um, you take the x-ray or whatever scan you're looking at and you divide it in half and you look for the differences. So this one's a tough one, but you can see these markings here. These are normal markings. This is the normal architecture of the lungs. You can't really see that on this side. You could see it's, it's completely collapsed here. And so that's the problem. And again, if, like I said, if your brightness is up, you could see this is a little bit darker. So. Um, it doesn't have all these markings. So that's a tough one. Um, but if you're looking for that on an x-ray, um, yeah, that's what you uh, want to look for. And yes, this one's not as apparent, but yes, because the pressure is coming from one side, the trachea is going to deviate to the opposite side. Once you get in turn four, they talk about it going both ways differently. But for right now, all you need to know is pressure is going to come from one side. So the trachea is going to deviate to the opposite side, right? With, with all the organs as well. You can see that here. So air is going to come in and not be able to get out. So once air gets in, it's trapped. It pushes everything to the other side. So you can see the trachea is going to deviate away, OK? All right, the trachea, mediastinal shift, whole thing. Everything's going to shift away. But the main thing you need to focus on is trachea is going to deviate away. Um, this one's much easier to see. So you can see. So we divide it in half. You could see that you could see the plural markings here and you could see this completely black space. So the lung is completely collapsed. There's probably some sort of injury around here and there's some sort of sucking wound. So it's opposite of these pictures where they're, it's coming in this way, uh, air is coming in on this side, on the patient's left side. So you can see this trachea is kind of diving out this way. It's not going straight down. And um, even the heart, this is very bad. This is. Um, um, definitely an emergency situation. So you can see that. So yeah, that's what you want to know for that. And again, yeah, this is a good one too. You can see it's darker here. It's completely collapsed. The lung and the trachea is severely deviated to the patient's right side. Okay, so this is from first aid. It kind of gets into it. But for right now, the tension is by far the uh, most important one you need to be able to, uh, to, uh, to recognize. So pancose tumors, 
typically these happen at the apex of the lungs. Uh, they often talk about, did they talk about, yeah, there it is. All right, so they happen here, um, you know, some of the, uh, the um, pathologies, the cancers that have to do with smoking, smoke rises, so you get them at the upper aspect of the lung. So small cell carcinomas, squamous cell even, uh, those can happen at the apex. What you need to know about this is that sometimes there is a mechanical compression that happens. So you can compress uh, the nerves and also the blood flow. So sometimes the patient will talk about numbness or pain in their hand. That could be due, due to uh, nerve compression or uh, even lack of blood flow. Also, and this is gonna come up again and again, uh, is this Horner syndrome. So if you have some sort of tumor in the apex of the lung, it can press on the sympathetic chain that runs right there along the vertebrae. Um, so you can get what's called Horner syndrome. So you knock out the sympathetics. So if you knock out the sympathetics, you have unopposed parasympathetics. So what would you expect? Ptosis, anhydrosis, and meiosis, right? The, the lid is gonna be a little bit uh, down, um, that's ptosis, anhydrosis, you're not going to be sweating. And parasympathetically, uh, you get meiosis. Y'all haven't really got into this the way I remember meiosis versus medriasis. Meiosis is a smaller word that means pinpoint pupils. Medriasis is a bigger word, so it means dilated pupils. So these are all parasympathetic symptoms. Why are you getting parasympathetic symptoms? Because the tumor is, in, is pressing on uh, the sympathetics. Right? So yeah, that's what you wanna look for. All right, so you know that the right lung has three lobes, the left lobe, ha the left lung has two because the heart kind of goes on the left side, right? So it kind of fills the space of that, where that other lung would be. So there are some fissures, all the lung, uh, both sides have this oblique fissure, um, but just the right side has the horizontal fissure. So you could kind of see that here. Uh, this would be your left lung, and this would be your right one, which has this horizontal fissure, right? Okay, and this just kind of points out, so an, an important point that they could ask you about is that if there's some sort of uh, injury, some trauma, say a knife wound to the back, uh, you're not likely going to hit that right middle lobe, right? Because you see it's kind of wedged in there. You don't really see it on the back side, and um, uh, so the way it's positioned is that if you actually puncture the, the patient's back, it's going to be on the lower lobe. Uh, this right, this middle lobe kind of fits in there. Uh, it, it's kind of pressed in there from the anterior side. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and you can see it's around the fourth, fourth intercostal space. All right, try this one. ETA is just prior to arrival. Yeah, so y'all got this one. So right, it's going to go down to the right bronchus. So the way the architecture is in the lungs, the most vertical uh, bronchi is the right bronchus. So you swallow a coin or whatever. What did he swallow? A small toy. Um, it's going to go to the most, most vertical spot, which is the right bronchus. All right. So the bronchial tree, the carina is that middle point. The, um, the uh, primary bronchi are going to come off to the lung. And then you have the secondary, the lobar. Lobar meaning it goes to each lobe. And then you have the tertiary segment uh, that breaks off into the lobe segments. So um, you'll get into this in term four a lot more when you talk about the different types of cancers that form in the different areas. But for now, just knowing that uh, you should be good to go. You can see here um, the way this is situated. Uh, the, um, the child actually swallowed a coin and it got stuck. So what actually happens is this concept called atelectasis. So physiologically, the, the place that is distal to, the, to, to wherever the blockage is. This happens a lot in people with bronchitis. They have, whereas it would be a coin here, um, they uh, actually have a, um, a mucus plug. 
So anything distal to it tends to collapse and that's just physiologically what happens. So, um, uh, so atelectasis is the thing that's pretty common uh, in some sort. So, but you need to know it for right now if there's some sort of, um, some sort of blockage. Uh, but th I, I, that's a concept that gets much more complicated later, but uh, don't get too concerned with it right now. But yeah, it's gonna go to the right lower lobe. Right, uh, star on this slide, you wanna know these. For some reason, these were just like a pain for me to, to, to remember. So I found it easier if you like correlate this name with this name, right? So if you call them hilar nodes and you know that, you know they're right about right around the hilum, okay? The, cari the carinal lobes are, are right around the carina because they, they're just very close to me. Um, so if you can, whatever you need to know, but there will be a qu test question on this. So um, they'll just ask the lymph node drainage. Remember, it's going to come, whereas blood goes to the lungs, the lymph's going to kind of drain outside the lungs and get to the um, to the thoracic duct and drain it. All right, try this one. All right, so anytime lobar pneumonia means obviously the lobe, this tends to be uh, bacterial. Um, it kind of collects and, and uh, consumes the, the whole lobe. So yeah, you tend to get consolidations there. Again, they're just introducing you to this, this idea um, and but y'all will get into that much more uh, going forward. So you could see, you would expect these plural markings, right, in the very, right around the hilum, but this is really extensive. Again, if you cut the cut the, uh, the image in half, right, look how much worse it is on this side to this side. So this is uh, a lot of fluid buildup. You get plural effusion. Sometimes it, it can, um, it could uh, turn into pneumonia depending on the situation. Um, but uh, there's a lot of pathology that goes to this. Uh, a lot of times this will lead to uh, pulmonary hypertension, which will lead to heart failure, stuff like that. But what we're seeing here is um, these pleural effusions are gonna be again on the outside, right, of the pleura, whereas pulmonary edema is gonna be, um, is going to be um, in the actual lungs, right? So there is a difference there. You need to be able to uh, differentiate that. But remember, uh, pneumonia is going to be fluid in the alveoli, these consolidations in the alveoli. All right, histology. Lindsay, you're up. Yeah, you want to show the answer? Yeah, that contains elastic fibers. And so this is kind of associated with some of the pathologies. So COPD, emphysema, all of those things, because if you start destroying the interalveolar septa, then you are going to mess, pretty much mess with the elasticity of the alveoli and its ability to be um, compliant. And um, so, yep. Let me just go back real quick, somebody. Collect, yeah, so answer B, collection at the base of the lung. Uh, yeah, uh, so be careful with that because um, it could be, uh, 
pulmonary edema doesn't tend to collect really at the base because the, the alveoli kind of go everywhere. Mm -hmm. It will, but if you get some sort of pleural effusion, they talk about blunting of the costodiaphragmatic recess. Like, like look at this. Um, you see how sharp this is? If you have um, fluid in the pleural, like a pleural effusion, you'll get blunting of this area. So it'll be kind of like shady, right? It'll be like, uh, you won't be able to see this sharp point. So that's the most dependent point. But technically you're not in the lung, you're in the pleural space. But when you get pleural uh, edema, uh, it tends to be more like this, right? It doesn't, I mean, to a degree it does go to the lower areas, but it's not gonna necessarily collect. Um, so yeah, uh, I would go with, go with that, yeah. Okay, so we are going to do histo moving down the system. So is this the first slide there? Or was there one before this? Oh, this is the first one, sorry. Okay, so first the trachea, the biggest thing here, um, you have the respiratory epithelium. Remember that respiratory epithelium is the ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. Um, you just need to know that that's what that is. So in the mucosa, you have the respiratory epithelium. Submucosa are the ceramucus glands, and then you have the hyaline cartilage. So I'm gonna annotate here. The biggest thing that you're going to be able to tell with the trachea is this cartilage region right here. And does anybody know what that backs up to? You can put it in the top. Yes, the esophagus. And so if you have a pathology question, I mean, it's right here, but if you have a pathology question that's associated with the trachea um, and the esophagus, and you need to know where they kind of back up to each other. Now, if you're not getting this nice view right here to tell you that this is the trachea, then you need to kind of look more towards the muscle and the glands right here. So you have the seromucinous glands and then you have this trachealis muscle right here. This is going to be a very huge, huge, huge thing. So this is the thing that's associated with the um, esophagus. It's adjacent to the esophagus. So this is what's going to form that um, gap in the ring, call it a gap right there. So make sure this is kind of obvious if you're giving given this view right here. It's not necessarily as obvious if you're given um, this view or this view, but if you are, associate yourself to the ceramucinous glands, you can see some right here, and also this trachealis muscle. That's going to help you um, identify where you are in the system. Okay, now we're going to continue moving down. So we are at the main bronchi. So we've lost that. Um, We've kind of lost some of that structure. We're going down. So the primary and main bronchi right here, how are we gonna tell the difference? So can you um, differentiate each segment? How are we going to tell the difference? Um, you have the cartilage plates at this point. So emphasis on the word plates that you're going to be able to see surrounding the um, bronchi. And so why do we care about this? So this is going to um, provide structural support. And then uh, the use is going to regulate the airway diameter. And you, in term four, you are going to talk a lot, a lot, a lot about different pathologies associated with the bronchi. And, um, you know, in people, in asthmatics, the bronchi are going to dilate up. Um, you can have bronchiolitis, um, all of these, um, pathologies that are associated with a shortness of breath, some kind of obstruction or restriction that is going to impair the ability to um, properly ventilate, the, you know, the distal alveoli. And so the bronchi, this is what regulates the airway diameter. That's why you have this muscular layer. And then the cartilage, this is going to um, provide some, some support. So, but just look at those plates 
right there. So you can see cartilage plate, cartilage plate, cartilage plate. So that's um, going to be the main identifier when you are looking at this right here. And then you can also see it here. You have cartilage plate, cartilage plate, cartilage plate. Yeah, constrict and asthmatic. Sorry, I probably said the wrong thing. <laughs> Okay, respiratory epithelium, you do need to know the different cells. Um, there are some um, pathologies associated with them. So both the respiratory, uh, respiratory epithelium lines most of the conducting part of the, of the respiratory system. So the conducting part is really just a um, tube that connects the outside world to the lungs. And the reason why you have the respiratory, respiratory epithelium, remember these are ciliated um, pseudostratified columnar. Um, and so pseudostratified, what that really means is that the nuclei don't line up. And so it looks like there's more than one layer, but there's really not. That's why it's called pseudostratified, but it really is just one layer of columnar cells. But these ciliate, these cilia right here, just to give you the idea, this is what's going to help um, bring up um, pathogens, mucus, anything that shouldn't get to the lungs, this mucociliary system is going to sweep it up and out. And that's how, you know, how you cough stuff out and get it out of your system. So that's, is a very, very important component of the conducting system to provide a layer of protection against the distal alveoli, because if you get buildup of mucus of, um, different particles in the lungs, that's when you're going to have the big pathologies. And so um, a big, big, big thing is the Cartagener syndrome, and they love testing Cartagener syndrome. So if you have a defect in the cilia, and y'all talked about this in FTM, if y'all have a de defect in the cilia, then you basically um, render it immodal. And so you can't get those secretions up and out of the lungs. And so one of the things is the mucus buildup in the Cartagener syndrome. That's just one of the many, many, many things that's associated with this syndrome. But that is um, why that is so important. Um, then mucus cells, these are, these are gonna have the blunted microvilli. Then you have the small granules. So these are most nu numerous at the bifurcation of the primary bronchi. And so make sure um, the, the increase in smokers, this is probably really important, but the primary cells associated in small cell carcinoma. I don't remember that being a big thing in term one. It um, will be a bigger thing in term four, but the biggest things you want to look at here are the smoking associated and then the cartagoners. That's going to be the biggest thing here. Um, smoking and bronchitis, I put this here. Um, the, these are the three things that you need to look at is so thickened basement membrane, hypertrophy of the smooth muscle and the increased glands. So all of this is going to be associated with the bronchitis. So if you thicken the basement basement membrane, hypertrophy of the smooth muscle, you're adding to the constriction and then increase of the mucus glands. That means you're going to increase mucus secretion. And so um, the combination of the increased mucus secretion and the hypertrophy of the smooth muscle is causing a little more constriction. You're going to get, um, you're not going to be able to breathe as well. You're not going to be able to clear that out. And so this um, on exam, you're going to see wheezing and cyanosis. They call these the blue bloaters because they aren't getting the ventilation. And so you get that cyanosis versus emphysema, which are the pink puffers because they have a lot of air in their lungs, but they can't really get it out. And there's a lot of destruction within the alveoli. And that's the whole thing with alveoli septa um, and the elastin. But that um, which is a huge thing in this module, actually, with Brady is going to talk about with some of the pathology. Um, but you do, 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 oh my goodness, please, please, please know the difference with COPD. And then under that umbrella is emphysema and um, the chronic bronchitis. So those are both COPD, but you need to know, Brady's going to talk about this, but you need to know the different charts associated with those two things. Okay. 
Squamous metaplasia. Um, anytime they talk about metaplasia, they're probably going to ask about this because metaplasia is so important in the progression of a disease. Remember, metaplasia is the one that is reversible. And so if you have metaplasia and you stop the um, insult to the area, it'll go back to normal cells. But remember, if you if the if the area keeps getting insulted, 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 then you can go from metaplasia to dysplasia. And dysplasia is irreversible, whereas metaplasia is reversible. And so they always like to have a question associated with the metaplasia, because if you stop this, if you, for example, smoking, um, if you stop that injurious thing, then you can go back to the normal cells. But um, this is talking about the metaplasia of the respiratory epithelium. Okay, bronchioles. So you have terminal bronchioles, you have respiratory bronchioles. Please know the difference between the two on the histo section. This actually was kind of confusing to me because um, when you get down to the distal um, system, it a lot of the terms are very similar to one another. Um, so just please be aware of that fact. So epithelium cilio, ciliated pseudostratified columnar, which are your respiratory epithelium, with goblet cells, that's important, uh, in the larger bronchioles. And then once you move down, you transition to the ciliated cuboidal. So the cells are getting smaller, which makes sense because you, as, as you get distal more down to the alveoli, the cells need to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And you have secretory club cells in the terminal and respiratory bronchioles. That is a huge, huge, huge thing. Please highlight that. Um, club cells are now towards the terminal and respiratory bronchioles. If you have a question that is talking about the difference in the two locations, this is going to be key. And we'll probably ask you this to differentiate the two sections. So please make sure that you understand that. You have the respiratory epithelium and the um in the, in the goblet cells and the in the larger airways. And then when you get down, you're getting more cuboidal and you get the club cells. So no glands and then smooth muscle is going to replace the cartilage. Remember the cartilage was mainly for structural support to keep that open in the trachea and the bronchi. Now, since we're getting down, we're losing the cartilage because we no longer need that and you get smooth muscle um, down there. So can you tell the difference between a bronchus and a bronchial? There is a very, um, yep, we are looking at the cartilage rings right there. So if you're looking at the cartilage rings and you see that muscle, you see the muscle around there, you know that you're in the bronchi, the bronchus, whereas the bronchial, remember, we're losing that cartilage. We're losing that cartilage. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, oh, I didn't, I didn't remember I had absolutely labeled this. Okay, cool. Thanks, past Lindsay. So you have the presence of glands. Remember, once you get down into the um, distal airways, you're losing those glands. You have the cartilage plates. You're seeing that muscle. And then on the left, you see that smooth muscle replaces the cartilage. So this is going to be your bronchi, so your bronchus, and then your bronchioles which are going to be the smaller ones with a little more distensible. Okay, so bronchial asthma, I kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but um, the big thing you need to know, treated with albuterol, it's beta to agonist. Remember, you have um, the thickening of the smooth muscle layer. Um, this is very similar to what we were talking about with the chronic bronchitis. You have the thickening of the smooth muscle layer. And then here you have the airway plug by cell debris and mucus. The biggest thing is going to be that mucus. Um, so, yeah. And then now we're getting down to the end of the airway. So you have the alveoli. So cell types, you have macrophages. So these are alveolar macrophages. This is wildly important. You're going to learn that in term four because <laughs> we just got out of our respiratory pathology section. So the alveolar macrophages are wildly important to protect this area. But you have the macrophages type one and type two pneumocytes. Remember type one are going to be those thin, more squamous cells that are going to line the um, barrier right there. And then the type two, those are more cuboidal. They're gonna be a little more towards the, um, those 
divisions, those branching points, type two pneumocytes are going to do the surfactant and type two pneumocytes are also going to replenish the type one cells. And so if there's this destruction to the type one pneumocytes, the type two pneumocytes can replenish that cell population. And so that's also an, an important thing. But if you see here, um, we kind of already talked about this, but you have the type one right here, notice how flat that is. That's a very flat cell, which it, versus here, you have a very large plump nuclei and it's more of a cuboidal cell. So more squamous, more squamous, more squamous. These are all type one. This is our type two pneumocyte. And then you have the alveolar macrophages in here that are going to be responsible for phagocytizing anything that um, gets down to the alveoli that should not be there. And they're called dust cells. I don't think that was a huge thing in term one. The alveolar macrophages are just called dust cells. They're just synonyms of one another. Somebody's screaming outside. Okay, so thin portion, thick portion of the air blood barrier. Thin portion, of course, this is for gas exchange. That's kind of intuitive because you want to, the, the thinner the portion, it's going to allow for that transport. So surfactant type, um, which increases the blood. Hold on, my dog's coming in to say hi. Hi, come here. They just got home from the ranch and the first thing he does is always come and say hi to me. <laughs> okay, but um, type one pneumocytes, of course, because these are going to be the squamous cells and they're going to, he usually doesn't like come. Yeah, he gone. <laughs> he went back. He just wanted to say hi and tell me I, I, he was here. <laughs> But, um, and then the thick portion, um, of course, more surfactant, but this is going to, the difference between this is going to have more of the connective tissue elements right here. But the biggest thing you need to know is that the thin portion is the most effective blood air barrier. So that's the takeaway from this. Okay. You will probably have a couple questions on this. This is very important. Um, emphysema, these are gonna be your pink puffers right here. So remember emphysema, um, chronic bronchitis, and then pulmonary fibrosis, they love to talk about on this exam with respect to the physiology charts that are graphs that Brady is going to go over. But the thing is it's distal to the terminal bronchioles. Um, the biggest, biggest, biggest thing is the serum alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. And so normally the neutrophils are going to secrete um, the, the alpha one antitrypsin to counteract elastase activity. So you have the elastase activity that is going to break down elastin. Remember elastin was a component of the intraalveolar septa. So if you start breaking down that septa, you start getting these pockets of air and you are not getting really um, effective um, gas exchange. Oh my God, I can't think. Gas exchange because you're destroying those areas. And so you get air trapping is what it's called. Um, so you get air trapping, the air is kind of just sitting there, honestly, and you can't really get it out very effectively. And so that's why in emphysema, this is such a dangerous thing. But if you have a deficiency in the alpha-1 antitrypsin, then you can have overactivity of the elastase. They call it a, an imbalance of proteases and antiproteases. That's how they did it on our exam. Um, but that's the thing. It's an imbalance between proteases and antiproteases that are going to cause the destruction of the elastin in the inter alveolus septa, and then you're going to break that down. You have, and um, so dilated air spaces, loss of surface area for gas exchange. Um, so everything I circled on the slide is really important and can be an answer to a question or something that will give you the answer to the question. So ele elevated elastase, destruction of elastic fibers, loss of surface area, and then alpha-1 antitrypsin. So all of those points can be identifiers or an actual answer to a test question. Um, okay. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing. If you're, if uh, a lot of times these patients present with liver failure too. Uh, it just has to do with the liver as, as well as the, the lung. Sometimes they'll put that liver value in there. They'll put elevated 
you know, ASTs or ALTs, and that could lead to it. So a lot of times, whereas emphysema would take, you know, 20 years of smoking, you'll see people that smoke that have this alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, they can get, um, you know, uh, you know, pathology or chronic lung problems in very quickly, like within five years, because they have nothing to counteract all the neutrophils, all the elastase, because alpha-1 antitrypsin is an anti-elastase, right? So it's going to counteract it. So you'll see a younger patient, probably a smoker, also has liver problems. All right, let's see how far we are. Maybe we can take a break if y'all want. Um, oh God, yeah, let's take a break. That's fine. We'll do like five minutes. All right, has it been five minutes? You doing this? Yeah, I go for it. All right. Now let's look at some more of the physiology stuff. So some of these, um, yeah, if they, I don't think you really need to know this, but if they do, it'll be straightforward. I don't, I don't remember them giving us a, an equation like this. Uh, we'll get to some of the more important equations. So again, we kind of talked about the type one versus type two. Those type twos are going to come in importance. And um, we're going to talk about the surfactant in, in more detail. And I'll try to explain it to you the way, uh, the way I understand it. So, but the whole idea is that it's going to increase surface tension. And um, so uh, that the idea is to keep the alveoli open. Um, the main component is uh, DPPC, right? And you know, I just remember DPPC because if I see this on the test, I could work it out that that's that. But if you want to learn how to say that, be my guest. Um, the point is, though, uh, and the, you should you should know this is that when the when the child's born, you want a less less than to sphingomyelin ratio of two to one. That's just kind of the standard. The lecithin is diphosphatidylcholine, and it actually is the major component of this. So DPPC is what you're looking at here. Um, if you remember that back from FTM1, we kind of discussed it, but that's the major component of uh, surfactant. I, I really like this slide just because it kind of lays out everything you need to know histologically, right? So some of those histology slides aggravate me, but if you look at this, you can kind of see how deep uh, uh, the different layers go. So remember the conducting zones are just pathways, right? It's just a conduit to get to the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone is where you're gonna have gas exchange. And for this uh, conducting zone, the larger area is gonna have you know, more force on it so that therefore you're gonna need more cartilage, more protection. So kind of as you go down the respiratory tree, uh, you kind of get less cartilage. And so if that helps you on the exam, um, it, it helped me out. And you could kind of see like, it's very important to have cilia up, up at the top, right? To get any sort of dust that goes through or anything like that, um, to be able to sweep it up with that mucociliary escalator. But then of course, elastic fibers, you wanna go all the way to the bottom because you want that recoil effect after you breathe in, have gas exchange, you want the elastic fibers to kind of, uh, to, to, to have good compliance and come back to normal so that uh, you can get uh, um, air out. Uh, this is from first aid. Um, I'm big on first aid. Uh, so this kind of just breaks it down uh, in a little more detail. So take a look at that. Now, there's two basic principles and we're gonna go through the basics and um, I'll bring you through my methodology of how I work through the obstructive versus restrictive. Um, at least in a physiolo physiological sense. So um, when we talk about this, uh, these conducting problems are typically obstructive problem or they are obstructing problems. The thing is you're able to get air in, it's just very difficult to get air out, right? So once the air is in, uh, the, um, the bronchi tend to collapse. So you get what Lindsay was explaining earlier is this air trapping effect. This is when you get these pink puffers, these people with emphysema, they're pink because they're able to have gas exchange. The problem is they can't get the air out. So you're able to get it in, but then everything kind of collapses on itself. So we'll get into that in a little more detail. The now obstructive, that's what we were talking about. If we talk about restrictive, that's more of a problem getting air in, right? So if you can't get air in, there's no real gas exchange. When I think of restrictive, I think of fibrosis, right? You don't, the, you know, the actual parenchyma or the cells um, are not able to expand. So if you can't expand at all, we, we, you know, when you take a deep breath in, there's, you know, there's no, um, there's no negative pressure, right? So you're, you're not able to get air in. Um, 
Okay, and this is that mucociliary uh, transport, this escalator, the cilia sweep one way unidirectionally up and out, right? So the mucus is secreted um, and you get, the, uh, everything gets swept out. Uh, chronic bronchitis, big thing. Uh, so here's the thing, like when, when you get when you get COPD, that, com that comprises emphysema and chronic bronchitis. You don't, I mean, technically we define them differently, but they're based, I mean, they happen together, right? When you get emphysema, you, when you're this pink puffer, you get this air trapping effect, you're also going to get the chronic bronchitis that goes along with it. And chronic bronchitis, I think of it as just um, a lot of extra mucus, right? You're going to have um, hyperplasia of the um, of the goblet cells because you all you're having this constant insult or this constant uh, smoke toxin going through there. So along with the damage from emphysema um, that's causing the air trapping, you're also going to get the increased um, uh, the increased mucus buildup. So that's what you're worried about with chronic bronchitis. Along with that, you also get damage to the cilia as well, so you don't get proper transport. Um, I would note this equation here, um, but the, the pressure and volume are inversely proportional, right? So the way it works is um, the more pressure you have, the less volume. And you can see that here, right? If you contract this down, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you're having more pressure. So it's going to decrease your volume. If you have more volume, you're going to decrease your pressure. And that just tends to be how it goes. And so uh, it works out um, that way. Temperature is gener generally considered constant in these equations, but uh, there is a component if they give you different temperature variables. Um, you need to know those, but I doubt they would do that. So this comes into play a lot when we talk about the different spaces, right? Because um, it has this negative pressure effect on the pleural space, right? So the diaphragm is going to contract. It's going to pull this pleural space down. And since this is kind of a confined space, uh, that negative pressure is going to pull the lungs down, right? So they are, they are, they work together, but technically the pressures are independent of each other, right? You have to have the diaphragm to contract to allow the pleural space to contract or to, to allow the pleural space to um, get a negative pressure. Therefore, the lungs can be pulled down as well. So um, they, they work together, but the pressures are considered separate. And you could see that here, right? So again, the whole idea is that um, if the diaphragm contracts, you get the pleural space, a negative pressure there, and then you'll get the negative pressure uh, in the lungs and you'll be able to breathe air in. Um, and the same thing works when you exhale too, right? You get a positive pressure, breathe air out. And that's that recoil effect. Um, this is kind of what we were talking about before. All right. We'll talk about some of the uh, mechanics going on here. Um, it's a little bit more advanced than, uh, or a little bit more than what, uh, a little bit extra from what we were talking about prior. Okay, so again, when the uh, diaphragm contracts, you get a negative pressure here. Once this negative pressure is strong enough, it'll pull on the lungs, so you get a pressure there. This is why if you get some sort of, uh, um, fluid in the, you know, any, any sort of uh, pleural fluid or some sort of pneumothorax or anything like that, it, impacts, it affects the pressure gradient, right? So if you get a positive pressure here with a pneumothorax, it can push the lung to the side, right? So it's, it's, it's very important that this is a stable area uh, with no gas exchange. That way it has the proper um, pressure gradients to be able to pull the lung down. So uh, this is more, it seems more confusing than it really is. This just uses the equation uh, P1 uh, times V1 equals P2 times V2. Because look, it's inversely proportional. As you increase the volume, you're decreasing the pressure, okay? As you decrease pressure, uh, you're increasing the volume. And that's how the, um, the lungs expand, right? You, uh, as you decrease the pressure, you get a negative pressure, the lungs expand, right? And air is able to go in. So it just works together. Um, don't make this more complicated than it needs to be. And this, this volume and pressure that is inversely proportional, as you can see here, correlates to the flow, okay? So the flow of air in versus the flow of air out correlates to uh, changes in pressure and volume. All right, a little more summary there. Uh, don't get too hung up on this. Uh, you, uh, th this compliance factor is inversely proportional to elasticity. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just the concept that um, um, 
the um, so okay, so first off, we could talk about the equation here. So the elasticity is going to be how much effect you get back, right? So how much the rubber band pops back. The compliance is going to be how much it's able to hold, right? So if something's going to snap back to normal, it's not going to hold as much. So the stronger the elasticity or the recoil effect, the less compliant, right? Or the more compliant it is, the less recoil effect it's going to have. Okay, so they work, they are inversely proportional. Now this graph is a little confusing, but the whole concept is that uh, when you inhale and exhale, it is a little bit different, right? So between inhaling and the time you exhale, there is a difference in pressure change, and it just correlates to the small amount of the actual air pockets that, um, that have to open up, right? So once everything opens up, then the air is able to flow out. Um, but I don't think they'll ask you about this. I just wanted to put this in here for complete mistake, but uh, don't get bogged down with this too much. Um, and the, the whole the whole idea of this, this is called this hysteresis. And this is this physiological lag. Like I said, when, the, when everything has to open up and you work on this surface tension, these frictional forces, uh, it changes the pressure just a little bit, okay? From inhaling to exhaling, okay? So we don't get anything like this, but I just want, didn't want y'all to um get get uh, bogged down with that all right so let's talk about service tension i have when is that thing here it is okay cool um so it's a little tricky because uh the more the increase an increase in radius is actually going to decrease your pressure and it may seem i'll show you what i'm talking about in a second but what we're, what we're saying here uh is that you're going to have the, the ultimate the ultimate physiological property is going to be to collapse the alveoli, right? You can see here, this is the pressure that's collapsing down on it. So the question is, well, how do you keep the alveoli open? How do you keep it open if everything wants to collapse on itself, if this pressure is going to collapse everything? Well, the idea uh, is that uh, you're going to use surfactant. And surfactant is going to put an opposite uh, force on this alveoli to keep it open. So what you need to know now is that Radius is in the denominator, so increased radius equals decreased pressure. Now keep that in mind. So if I told you there was no surfactant, this is what's going to happen. Uh, let me go to this slide first and then we'll go back. Now, me personally, if you told me this and you told me there was a valve right here, I would tell you, because I'm smart like that, that all of this air from this orange balloon is going to go to the purple balloon because it looks like that's what's going to happen. Uh, I don't think it's, it's not necessary to watch it. I don't think the, we, the clip doesn't work anyway, but what actually happens, um, you can go check it out on your own, but it, uh, what happens is the air actually goes, once you turn this valve from the purple balloon to the orange balloon. I don't know if you want to call it a paradox, but it's not exactly what you would think, or at least what I would think, but it comes down to the principle that uh, increased radius equals decreased pressure. So this surface air or, or this pressure uh, collapsing down on this balloon is actually higher than this just because it has less surface area, all right? Same amount of tension, but less surface area. So if you turn the valve, everything's gonna go this way. Interesting, right? Well, that, that brings up a problem because if you have this smaller alveoli and this larger one, then if, if everything stays the same like here, then all of the air is gonna go from the smaller one to the bigger one. And that's a problem, right? We don't wanna have all these collapsed alveoli. How do we get gas exchange? So what's the answer? The answer is surfactant. Now, surfactant is going to put um, an equal, um, so it's gonna put this uh, outward force, right? So if I said that everything wants to collapse down on this small alveoli, the surfactant is gonna put an equal force this way. Okay, so we're going to get into it in a little more detail that makes it a little more complicated, but just for now, just keep that in mind that we're going to have an equal force going inward and are going outward just to keep the alveoli open. And so that gets away from this property, right? If we added surfactant you know, physiologically in the lungs to, to uh, this, it would be able to stay open to some degree, right? It wouldn't collapse on itself. The child wouldn't go into respiratory distress, you know. That's the idea between surfactant. Um, they did ask us questions about these. So just make a note to uh, 
I don't know why, but they did. So just to make a note that you know that two of them go together, I forget which one. Uh, long defense, A and D, B and C go together and A and D go together. So just make sure that you know that. Okay, so this is where I wanted to expand the idea of the surfactant because it's kind of interesting. Now, when you have, um, when the lung is completely, uh, it, it, when the alveoli is at its smallest point, the surfactant is able to bunch up like this, which means you have increased ability to have this outward force, okay? Let me try. So for this guy right here, right? At its smallest point, we have a lot of force, right? Because we have a small surface area, so the amount of surfactant molecules can bunch up like this. Now, why is that important? The, the reason it's important is because at this point, like think about the balloon, when the alveoli is at its smallest point, theoretically, it's going to want to collapse, right? So it's very important that you have this surfactant bunched up like this because it's able to hold it open. Now, as you actually expand the lungs, right? And this, this correlates to this area, right? So as you get to point one and you expand the lungs bigger, um, the surfactant is, is kind of spread out, right? Same amount of molecules, but now our surface area got so much bigger. So if that's, if that's the case, but we, we don't really need so much surfactant there, right? because we have a larger surface area, it can hold its own uh, uh, size and um, expansion on its own. So the point being is, you know, whatever, whether it's a paradox or not, when, this, uh, when the alveoli is, is its smallest, that's when the surfactant is most important, okay? And we, you could get a question like this, um, when you say that there's the least amount three uh, of size, relative area, size, uh, the surface tension is the lowest, right? So that's why you need the uh, surfactant to work. Once it's large, like the bigger balloon, it tends to be able to hold up on its own. So that's the whole idea behind that. So it is interesting, it's very important, and um, it's probably the most important concept um, in pulmonary. All right, try this one, just so we get our orientation down. Yeah, right, exactly. So um, it's the same picture as here. So uh, it would have been easier if I gave you the relative area on the x-axis. So as the area increases here, the balloon's larger, you're not gonna need as much, um, you're not gonna need as much surfactant, right? The air's in there, it's holding the walls open. When we're over here at, uh, at the lowest point, um, you're going to need uh, the surfactant to help hold it open. So the surfactant, yeah, the surfactant is able to uh, prevent the alveoli from collapsing, collapsing, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, yeah, and you can see that here, inspiration versus expiration. It also prevents overinflation as well. And so when you are um, completely deflated, it's going to prevent collapse and they're going to bunch together. But when you're completely inflated, they're going to spread apart, but they're also going to hold on to each other so that you don't ru essentially rupture the alveoli because that is going to be bad too. So, so um, it's kind of, it, it helps in both areas. So overinflation and underinflation. All right, let's try this one. No, you're right. No, so sorry. Yeah, the, so the surface tension is going to what I might have said that incorrect. The surface tension is going to what uh, is going to want to collapse on itself, right? That tension, and then the the surfactant is going to be what pushes out on it. Yeah, exactly. All right, what's going on here? All right, so let's look at some things that should stand out to you on expect on inspection. Increase anterior posterior diameter. 
classic for emphysema, this barrel chest effect, right? Why do they get that? That's because of the air trapping. The actual volume of the lungs, they could hold more in their lungs. Well, they're forced to hold more in their lungs just because, uh, because they can't get the air out. So when they're breathing in, they're trapping the air. So the anterior posterior diameter gets bigger. They get this big barrel chest, right? Pursed lips, that's classic for it too. We're gonna to talk about that in a second. The idea is that by pursing your lips, you're putting a positive pressure and that kind of allows the bron bronchioles to stay open to get that air out, right? So it's, a, it's just a little trick they, uh, they try to use to, um, to do that. No scleral icterus. Why is that important? Well, that indicates that there's liver failure. And remember I told you earlier, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency correlates with liver failure as well. So that's a good, a good point. You could say, well, there's no liver failure. Um, uh, so you wouldn't expect that. Plus uh, he's 50 and he's smoking. Yeah, probably not. But again, remember that that liver failure is a, is a good little trick to remember the alpha-1 antitrypsin. 75 pack years, that's a lot, right? So more than two packs a day or me, yeah, something like that, um, right? Because he's not 75. So he's gotta be smoking a lot, one and a half, two packs a day. Um, tachycardic, hyper-resonant lungs, decreased breath sounds, no evidence of hepatomegaly, right? Again, no, uh, no signs of alpha-1 antitrypsin. So classic, right? This is what you would expect for emphysema. So this is this endpoint pressure. So people with emphysema and you get damage to this lining and this pressure here, uh, this endpoint pressure moves closer to the alveoli. So in normal people having the point pressure, uh, um, equal at this point, uh, it helps to keep the bronchioles open. Okay. If you move this endpoint pressure down here, you're going to get air trapping. You're going to get collapsing of this area here uh, in the bronchiole, and it's going to end up uh, air trap. You're going to end up with air trapping. So, what actually pursing their lips actually does is helps to put a positive pressure and it brings that endpoint pressure back to normal. Okay. So, when they blow out, when they take it, when they, you know, when they expire, uh, they're able to keep this, this open. So this endpoint pressure has to do with uh, being able to keep the, uh, the bronchioles and bronchi uh, patent, right? And you could see that here. So healthy lung, this endpoint pressure is up here. If this endpoint pressure gets too low like that, uh, again, we're looking at something like emphysema. Um, so they could ask you something like that. But the point being is that it's going to end up collapsing, right? If it collapses, it's going to be difficult to get that air out. Right? Why are they pink puffers? Um, well, because they were able to get air there, right? They were able to uh, um, have oxygen exchange, but uh, you can't get the air out now. Obstructive lungs disease, right? All right, cool. That's what we talked about. All right, so what is this? Okay. Um, right, so high compliance just means they're able to hold more, right? Lung capacity. So, um, uh, over a smaller amount of pressure. So people with emphysema are gonna have uh, a higher lung uh, capacity. You may think, well, that sounds like a good thing, right? You could hold more air in, but no, it's problematic because the, re the only reason they have this increased lung capacity is because they're not able to get the air out. So it's not an efficient system, but you would expect high compliance, compliance meaning how much you can hold, how compliant are you? All right, so pink puffer can't get air out. now. People with restrictive lungs disease, remember I said that was a problem getting in. Restricted is decreased compliance. Those, those vessels are, are, sorry, those bronchi are fibrotic, right? So you, they won't expand. So you're gonna get uh, fibrosis and uh, decreased lung compliance, okay? So that's gonna be like line two. Blue bloater, cannot get air in, right? So um, this is a little tricky. It just correlates. I think this picture does it better that there is an equal pressure. Um, there, there is equal gradient between the chest wall pressure going outward, holding the lungs from collapsing inward, right? Because if you didn't have the trash chest wall holding you, the, 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 or, or sorry, or putting an outward force, the lungs would collapse. And a good example of this is if you get a pneumothorax, right? So if you, if you have some sort of injury here, uh, that could affect the chest wall expanding, therefore the lung is gonna collapse on itself. So the natural state, the lung does wanna collapse, you know, the chest wall going outward helps to keep it open. So just be aware of that and any changes pathologically can change um, uh, 
those values. But uh, honestly, I think the only question they really asked us was like, I think they asked us these values, like what landed there, like, or something like that. Yeah, it's been a while now. Um, uh, yeah, so we're gonna go through the, yeah, we'll do the FBC one in a second. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, we'll talk about that because that's actually how I do all these. That's the first thing I look at when I do it. Um, so uh, this just kind of sh shows you, I think this is an asthmatic, yeah, asthmatic. Um, so the changes in lung volume, right? So remember asthmatics, it's obstructive. They're able to get air in that those dust particles go in with it, right? They get some sort of uh, anaphylaxis or allergic reaction. All the vessel, um, all the bronchi close up, the smooth muscle uh, dilates and you get bronchial constriction, right? And um, so then you can't get the air out. So you could see this has a decreased compliance uh, with that. So just kind of be able to orient yourself. Uh, it's not as much memorization as it is just kind of understanding what are we talking about here, volume over time. Okay, you could see here, if there's some high resistance, meaning they're, they're, they're active asthma attack, uh, you can see how it was decreased here. Yeah. All right, try this one. Okay, no, so emphysema will increase your compliance. Asthma doesn't necessarily decrease your compliance because asthma falls under obstructive lung disease. So with asthma, you actually get an increased compliance to a degree because you're you are air trapping it, but it's not as bad because it's um, it's periodic. Uh, when you think of a decreased compliance, think of the restruct the restrictive lung diseases. So like anything with fibrosis. Um, a lot of times that has to do with like people that work with coal, um, stuff like that, that inhale a lot of dust. It, it tends to make their lungs fibrotic. Okay, what's going on? Uh, patient always had episodes. Um. Okay, I don't know why this is in here. Uh, so, well, um, yeah, so you get lactic acidosis um, when you get, uh, maybe, okay, that's, that must be why. Okay, so if you're gonna work out, obviously you're gonna build up lactic acid. Any sort of acidosis is gonna cause um, decreased oxygen, uh, um, uh, oxygen tension, right? So if you get acidosis, um, you're going to uh, need to breathe more heavily. So maybe this is why, um, yeah, this is why this person is actually feeling the feeling, um, feeling this pain or this angina, which is, uh, it looks like it's stable angina just because it's when they exercise. But um, the problem is that this lactic acidosis uh, tends to decrease your oxygen tension. So you're going to uh, want to, um, you're going to have to breathe more, right, to, to transport more oxygen. But this has to do, oh, this is why I put that in there, right? Because when we talk about the shifting, right, so any sort of acidosis is going to give you a right shift, okay? Anytime you want to offload, and this is a very important concept, anytime you want to offload uh, oxygen, it's going to be a right shift, okay? So your right shifted in the tissues. So for instance, in the last question, if you have lactic acidosis, it's gonna build up in the tissues. Now that's gonna tell the oxygen that's coming in on the red blood cell to offload the oxygen, okay? Now, when you get into the lungs, you wanna grab onto the oxygen. So you're gonna get a left shift right here. And this left shift is going to tell the body to, or tell the red blood cells to grab onto the oxygen. Okay, so anything here, you can see anything that causes a right shift, uh, acid, CO2, right? Again, that means the muscles are working. Uh, high altitude, you're gonna need more offloading, increased temperature as well. And then we're gonna talk about 2,3 BPG in a second, but it's the basic principle of it is to increase offloading. Okay, so you're gonna have increased 2,3 BPG in the lungs, 
just because just so uh, you're able to uh, offload more um, more oxygen. Now, this is a concept. It just basically means that the perfusion, uh, which tends to be uh, dependent on the lungs, right, the, on gravity, whereas air comes in and it tends to be at the top. But the way the architecture architecture works with the forces is the lungs kind of hanging, right? So it has this pressure to actually push the um, the air down in this region. So you actually get good air exchange uh, in zone two, right? And zone two to zone three, and not as much. You get a lot of um, uh, oxygenation uh, in zone one, but not a lot of perfusion, right? You're gonna get more perfusion because again, the perfusion is dependent or the blood flow, which is perfusion is dependent on gravity. All right, this is definitely uh, testable. The way I do this, uh, I focus on tidal volume. That's just your normal breathing pattern. Uh, then anything above your normal breathing, breathing pattern is your inspiratory reserve volume. Anything below your normal exhale is expiratory reserve. And then there's always a residual volume, okay? Anything that has capacity in it um, is going to be additive, okay? So the vol you're gonna add volumes up to get this, right? So this functional reserve capacity, you're gonna add residual volume plus um, uh, expiratory reserve volume. So be able to identify these and add and subtract as they uh, ask them. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna talk about this FEV1, our force of expiratory volume, uh, exhale volume, either way, uh, in one second, right? So it kind of tells how, how well you're able to get air out if there is some sort of obstruction over your function or force vital capacity, right? Um, now, this is the first thing I look for to determine whether it's obstructive versus restrictive. If it is obstructive, you're gonna get a severely decreased FEV1, okay? That means you're not able to get air out properly. That first second is kind of the guideline that they use. So if you, you actually get a decrease in the denominator and because of the air trapping, you actually get an increase in the denominator, okay? So with obstructive disease, you, uh, you're gonna get um, a decrease in this ratio, okay? Because the numerator is gonna go down severely. In restrictive, they, because you can't get air in, they both kind of go down together, okay? So I, I, I think it can be increased um, if it's bad enough, but I like to think of it as normal. That's all y'all need to worry about right now. That just basically means uh, you're not able to breathe out as much, but you're not breathing in as much either. So both the numerator and denominator go down. So that's how I do that. Um, try this one. Right, so if we have chronic bronchitis, right, that is an obstructive disease, so we know we're gonna decrease our FEV1. So the 50% is just, just to Im imply that it's decreased, right? So our numerator is gonna go down. All right, and this kind of just explains it uh, in a little more detail, and you could see how uh, that works. Okay, uh, same thing here, just good examples for you. Um, and this is gonna be important. Okay, now on our lectures, if I remember correctly, like they were messed up. These, not, let me see if I put it, no, I didn't. Um, so I took this from first aid, like somehow the doctor or whoever did the lectures like had these numbers backwards or something. So let's just walk through it. Um, so right here, this is your normal value right here. So your residual volume is here. So if you breathe all the way out, you're gonna have this amount of residual volume. Then you're gonna take a deep breath in, right? Right. So you're gonna uh, breathe in here, uh, take a deep breath in and you're gonna to get to six liters of air, right? And then you're gonna take a breath out. This is your force expiratory volume about one second and you're gonna breathe out. So it makes this, um, this pathway here, this, so uh, you are gonna start underneath 
and go and then go above, all right? So the point is that this is at the point where, <laughs> so you did mess it up, yeah. This is how it works, yeah. So I know it, was, it, was, it tripped me up too. So this is where you're gonna start breathing in. Your volume is at its lowest, uh, minus the reserve volume or residual volume. You're gonna take a deep breath in. That's where your, um, your lungs are maximally, your inspiration, <laughs> you've inspired to a maximal extent, I guess you wanna say and then you take a deep breath out, okay? So make sure if those, those numbers are messed up on yours, um, you fix those. Now, what if we look at the pathology? Now we said that the uh, total lung capacity, um, sorry, I, I might've said that the forced vital capacity went up in obstructive lung disease before, it's actually the total lung capacity. So the force, the, the forced vital capacity will go down, uh, so the denominator will go down, but it won't go down nearly as much as that FEV1 in the, in the numerator. So the point is that if you have an obstructive lung disease, the numerator is gonna decrease a lot more than uh, the denominator. Now, so what does that look like? Well, look at our starting point. We're already starting with a significantly more of a residual volume, right? So when you take a deep breath in, over time, you're gonna get that barrel chest. You're gonna end up breathing in a lot more air and uh, a lot more total lung capacity, right? And then when you breathe out, you're getting to a point where, you know, so where you're, you know, about three and, you know, three and three quarters uh, uh, here, um, whereas you started, you know, less than two liters. So you could see that you're holding on to more air and that's just not an efficient process. Your body has to adapt to that because you're not able to properly get air out. I mean, look at the, your ability to breathe air out here compared to here. Right, so this is that concept of air trapping. Now you can see here with restrictive, they both decrease uh, pretty much equally. So the point is now you're starting, look how much less you're starting with residual volume wise. Um, and you're taking a deep breath in. So now where you were normally at six liters, you could barely get to four liters now, right? So that's just because everything's fibrotic. There's no compliance. Everything is just kind of narrow and you're not able to get it in. So um, get air in. So you can see the differences here. It's important that you can understand the concept, but just keep in mind, obstructive means you can't get air out. You're holding on to it. Restrictive means you can't get air in. So the volume should be, should correlate. <clears throat> All right, try this one. Right, so we just did this one. Um, Right, we said the right shift is gonna be decreased oxygen, right? So the right shift, I think I have it here again, yeah. So, um, right, so the one that's fibros the, the fi fibrosis. Now, I just want to point this out. If you were looking at this and you didn't know the answer, why would you pick pulmonary fibrosis anyway? Well, A through C all fall in the same category, right? So even if you didn't know what they were talking about, it's one of those, you know, the art of taking these sorts of tests, right? You can try to eliminate something based on just the category. So since A, B, and C all fall together, maybe fibrosis is the right answer. But anyway, um, you see this right shift here is restrictive. So that means you can't get air in. You would expect this number to be about the same, even though your total lung uh, capacity is decreased. All right, let's talk about hemoglobin. We'll try to make this a little quick since this is taking a while. All right, so hemoglobin is made up of four, uh, it's a tetramer, four different proteins. This is that quaternary system that where uh, different proteins come together as one. So you have four globin chains, two alpha, two beta, with an iron in the middle, right, of each of them. And um, this is how we're able to carry oxygen. Now, iron should be in the plus two state, ferrous iron. If for some reason it's in the ferric iron, you're not able to state you're not able to properly carry oxygen, so you get met hemoglobinemia. These people are blue. I don't know if this is edited or I can't imagine they're that blue, but they look blue to me. And um, that just means they have met hemoglobinemia, iron's in the three plus state, and you can't really carry it. So um, blue, they're blue people. So you give them methylene blue. I don't know, it's a reductant. It can convert iron to the plus two state. Hemoglobin versus myoglobin, myo meaning muscle. Of course, it's for storage, right? You, your muscle wants to eat up. It's very selfish. It wants to eat up all the oxygen. 
high tissue affinity. Remember, we're right shifting, right? We're completely offloading everything. Now, the idea of hemoglobin being a tetramer is that um, it has cooperative binding. Um, so uh, by binding one molecule, it's more likely to bind the second. By binding two, the more likely to bind the third. It's this cooperative process, which makes it uh, a good way to grab onto oxygen in the lung and also offload it properly in the tissues, okay? And this is the concept uh, that they're using with this stamp process. Like if you take one stamp off, you have to go through a lot of process. The second stamp is easier and the third stamp is easier. But what it does and that you need to be aware of is this cooperative binding effect creates a sigmoidal curve, okay? That's how you develop that. So you could see here, this is that sigmoidal curve, all right? And that just indicates this cooperative binding. You can see the myoglobin curve is not sigmoidal, okay? Um, now, what's important about 2,3-BPG? The thing about it is it's high in the tissues, which means what? That means you can offload it, right? So if, uh, if it's a negative allosteric effector, meaning it wants to make things dissociate, okay? So it's, gonna pro it's going to promote oxygen release in the tissues, okay? Just if you remember that, then you should be good. Now this can come into play, have y'all done this? Uh, no, y'all do that in term two, right? So you get into the hexokinase. I mean, I guess y'all kind of talked about it, but the idea here is if you have a hexokinase deficiency, you're not gonna make 2,3-BPG. What does that mean? Well, that means that uh, you're gonna end up holding on to more oxygen. You're not gonna be able to offload it properly, right? Well, what if you have a pyruvate kinase deficiency? Well, then you're gonna get a backlog of these intermediates. So you're gonna get increased 2,3-BPG. What does that mean? You're gonna be able to, in, you're gonna offload it uh, more than you need, right? So uh, it's a delicate balance, but it is an important point to bring in different, you know, the systemic idea of medicine uh, by using different pathways to alter the 2,3-BPG. This again goes with that curve. Any sort of acidosis is gonna be promoting offloading, right? So lactic acidosis uh, is gonna decrease oxygen affinity. So you're gonna to wanna to get rid of it. Um, and this again, I put it in here again, cause it's that important. However, you need to remember it. Just remember what's gonna give you a right shift versus what's gonna give you a left shift. I think I talk, yeah, we're gonna talk about uh, fetal hemoglobin in a second. Um, okay. So this is Dr. Impadia's uh, lecture. Um, so it kind of just explains how it works, right? So events in the lungs, you're gonna offload CO2. Typically CO2 is carried as bicarbonate in the blood. Um, there are some other forms, but that's the main point. And then you're gonna get oxygen. Carbonic anhydrase is that major um, enzyme that we worry about. In the tissue, same thing, except opposite, you're offloading oxygen, picking up carbon dioxide, converting it to bicarb, right? Okay, same thing here from, uh, from first aid for you guys to read. Uh, all right, and then you could see here, this is just the idea of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and uh, so carbon monoxide kind of hogs the, uh, the hemoglobin. And you could see that because it's not a proper curve. Um, this curve right here is not sigmoidal. So it's, there's no cooperative binding. So even binding one carbon monoxide will fill up the whole system, right? It'll, it'll shut down the whole system. So that's the kind of uh, concept they're getting at here versus the, the, proper, um, the proper cooperative binding. All right, so now we could talk about the fetal hemoglobin. Uh, it is alpha two delta two. So people that have thalassemias like beta thalassemia, they tend to have increased uh, uh, fetal hemoglobin because they have a problem mutation in the beta chain, uh, even sickle cell patients, they use uh, fetal hemoglobin promoters for uh, medication. Um, and I think y'all talked about a little bit of that. Uh, so yeah, so if you could use the gamma when there's a beta mutation, uh, it'll, it'll work better. So the thing about fetal hemoglobin, it actually causes a left shift. So <laughs> think of the baby wants to get the oxygen from mom's red blood cells, right? The only way to do it is to cause this left shift to grab onto it. So the fetal hemoglobin is actually gonna cause uh, a, mildly left, a mild left shift. And that's gonna allow the baby to grab on to, uh, to the oxygen. Over time, we get rid of most of the fetal hemoglobin and convert it to uh, the adult form. But um, with some pathologies, they actually do still uh, hold on to it. And, and the reason that it works like that is because it, uh, it is not gonna bind 2,3-BPG as tightly. 
which means that it's going to have a higher affinity. Remember, 2,3 BPG is going to help promote offloading. Higher O2 affinity uh, is going to mean um, less 2,3 BPG in this sense. All right, uh, this is just the idea that <laughs> glycated hemoglobin. So, so uh, diabetics, uh, you know, they take their blood sugar, but by looking at your hemoglobin A1C, you see you can get a measurement of a three month lifespan. So it, what ends up happening is the patient comes in and they, they, they've been very compliant for the last like 24 hours. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I've been real good. I eat fruits and veggies. And what actually happens uh, is, you know, people want to, you know, tend to want to look good for the doctor when they go in, they want to look healthy and, you know, be good. But what you can actually do is check this hemoglobin A1C and you can check um, if any hemoglobin has is glycated, which is by definition like non-enzymatic glycosylation. But what happens is if there's in, increased levels of insulin in the blood, it will actually uh, glycate the hemoglobin, right? And since red blood cells last about 90 days, or, you know, um, yeah, three to four months, uh, typically they say three months, um, uh, that's, that's how you measure it. So if there's an increased amount of glycated hemoglobin, that means there's been increased insulin, uh, I'm sorry, that means there's been increased uh, glucose levels in the blood, okay? So that's what they look at. They look at this glycated hemoglobin, um, that forms. So uh, the, yeah, the red blood cells live about three months. So if you have a, a lot of glycated hemoglobin, that means over the last three months, you've had elevated levels of, um, of uh, glucose in, in your bloodstream. So that's a great measurement. That's kind of what they use as a standard of care now. Um, I think a, a below, above a 6.5 in measurement uh, is considered uh, diabetic. Now, or, or qualifies you as, as, as at least pre-diabetic. The difference here, if we talk about hemoglobinopathies, the qualitative change, you, you're talking about, basically you're talking about a sickle cell, right? So you, uh, you have enough of the alpha and beta chains, you just have a mutation there. With thalassemia, you have decreased quantity of them, okay? So with, with sickle cell, the quality is messed up, with thalassemia is you have decreased amount. So the amount that's there is proper, it's just less of it. <clears throat> so um, hemoglobin S, sickle cell mutation, right? So you get, they like to talk about this um, position, specifically uh, the posi position six on the beta chains. Uh, glutamic acid is replaced by valine. Valine is not charged. So what it does is it make, wants to make a hydrophobic pocket. So the, the cell will actually collapse on itself, specifically in decreased oxygen tension. So that's actually what forms these sickle cells. And y'all will get into that a lot more uh, later. Um, let's see, hemoglobin S is very similar, except instead of replacing a negative charge with a neutral charge, you're replacing a negative charge with a positive charge. So it's not as common, but technically it's, it's worse because um, the, you know, the, you're completely changing the charge. And you are able to, I didn't put it, um, I think y'all have a picture of the gel electrophoresis. You should be able to look at that and tell uh, you know, where the lines are. Like, so hemoglobin S isn't gonna travel as far. Uh, sickle cell will be next and then glutamic acid, the negative would go all the way to the positive pole. Um, I think y'all do have a picture of it, but y'all should be able to notice that if they give y'all um, a picture. So you can see this is what happens when the cells uh, sickle, they end up clogging up the arteries. I live in Louisiana, we have a large sickle cell population down here, it's very sad. A lot of these kids come in and, um, uh, and they, um, and they have these these pain crises, and unfortunately, that you know, there's you know, they have you have to give them morphine. It's a lot of pain, um, and so uh, they they go through a lot. But there are some different uh, medications that they're using now, and uh, transfusions to help them out. No, but uh, question, no. So HBS, um, HBS and sickle cell are the same. Was I saying HBS or HBC? Sorry, I might have said HBS. Uh, the one that changes. <laughs> Um, from glutamic acid to leucine or lysine is hemoglobin C. Um, I'm not actually, I, we talked about that. I'm not sure if y'all did, but it, hemoglobin S is sickle cell, S for sickle cell. Hemoglobin C is the other one. Um, it's not very important, the hemoglobin C thing. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so this is the medication I was talking about. Hydroxyurea helps to uh, make uh, euchromatin out of the hemoglobin F, which is convenient because the hemoglobin F will work in these patients, right? It will help with their oxygen carrying capacity. So it'll kind of get rid of that beta chain or help to depress it and give um, uh, extra uh, delta change so that they could uh, properly um, transport oxygen. And what actually happens is the malaria, malaria life cycle lasts about the lifespan of a normal red blood cell. So because these sickle cell patients, their cells sickle, the red blood cells don't last as long. And because of that, uh, the malaria can't properly uh, replicate its cycle. Okay, so it actually makes them protective. So people that are heterozygous for the he, for the uh, sickle cell mutation, uh, they tend to have protection against malaria just because their cells don't live as long. So that's why there's a prevalence in um, some of the African countries. All right, here's hemoglobin C. So this is what I was saying. Yeah, it's, it's glutamic acid to lysine. So it goes from a negative charge to a positive charge. And that's the idea there, but it's not nearly as tested as, um, as sickle cell. And here's the gel electrophoresis, right? So if we're running down the gel from negative to positive charge, you would expect normal hemoglobin with the glut glutamate or glutamic acid, which is negatively charged to go far the furthest. The sickle cell one, which is just to a neutral charge to go next and uh, the hemoglobin C <clears throat> to, go, uh, to not go very far because it has a negative charge. So that's definitely testable. As I said earlier, the thalassemias tend, uh, they have to do with quantity, right? So a decreased quantity, you're decreasing the rate of synthesis. So you, you, have, you just have sheer uh, decreased numbers of actual um, red blood cells. Alpha thalassemia, um, there's different versions of it depending on how many uh, deletions or mutations that you have. Um, this isn't too important, but there is the difference between a cis mutation and a trans, um, but you can see down here, this is the important stuff you need to know. Uh, usually, uh, if, you, if you just have two, two gene, gene mutations, um, it's not, it's asymptomatic or you may get mild, hem uh, mild anemia. Three genes uh, deletion is when you actually get hemoglobin H uh, that could cause uh, hemolytic anemia, severe hem or moderate to severe. And then if you lose all four, uh, that's not, uh, viable with life. So um, that's BART's. And um, yeah, this is the cis trans thing. So because cis are on the bo both on the same side, those tend to uh, be worse because you can inherit them both. Trans, at least you have the option of getting the other one, but that's not terribly important either. And like I said, hydrops vitalis means it's not compatible with life. All right, let's see. What also happens, you should note that if you have a severe beta thalassemia, you can get uh, the alpha change can, um, can like coagulate together. You get these uh, alpha tetramers as well. So um, be aware of that. And this is what we were saying. Some are worse than others. There are different mutations uh, that correlate with each, um, but major tends to be either deletion or some sort of, uh, there's either a deletion or um, I think it, it's some mild mutation, but they both basically correlate to the same thing, decreased synthesis overall. And what ends up happening is because you have decreased synthesis, your body's gonna keep telling itself, we need to make more, um, more red blood cells. So by doing that, you actually get this uh, crew cut appearance. That just means that the cells are actually overworking uh, the bone marrow is overworking, trying to make more blood cells always. And yeah, so a good point to make note of is that you you start to see this right around six months and that's when you get rid of this uh, gamma chain, which is from the hemoglobin F. Hemophilia, I think y'all talked about this briefly. You get this bleeding into joints primarily. A is factor eight, B is factor nine. So you should be aware of that, the genetic factors that correlate to them. Um, and y'all kind of talked about the skewed act inactivation as well, right? If one of the, the female, uh, it's supposed to be random, but if for some reason, uh, the mutated strand on the X, the mutated X is more prominent, you can sort of see symptoms. 
All right, uh, quickly, we could try to go through this. Um, this is just the partial pressures that you could see there. I don't know if they really give you, uh, again, since you don't have uh, scratch paper, they'll probably stay away from doing stuff like this, but you should know that oxygen is, is about 21%. Then you get into the minute by uh, ventilation uh, as well. So tidal volume times frequency uh, tells you how much you're at in a minute. Dead space, we talked about the conducting zones. Remember those, that's, that's basically your dead space, anything that's in the conducting zones. Uh, the respiratory zone is going to be where all the oxygen exchanges. So anything that correlates to the conducting zone is dead space. And uh, you go through the, um, you could figure out how much actually gets to the alveoli by subtracting the dead space, right? Um, a lot of these are just sheer memorization for the equations, um, but this goes into, uh, I don't think they got into this in too much detail about doing it uh, differently. They did talk about the, uh, not this one, the carbon monoxide one, I believe. Uh, and it's just, they use the carbon monoxide just as a measurement to see how much gas exchange you actually have. But this is a good equation to know for sure. Um, yeah, and it, the point is you could replace uh, the arterial um, CO2, like an arterial blood gas uh, to change for what's actually happening in the lungs. And this is ba the basic parameters here. So as blood goes along, you can get transfer of oxygen across and carbon dioxide across. So the, it's going this way. And you could see that there. Again, they'll give you normal values on the exam. More equations, uh, I don't, I think maybe they gave us like one equation on this. So don't spend too much time uh, memorizing these. Same thing here. This is kind of just a, a way of getting to, uh, getting the values by using um, uh, arterial blood gas. Right, same thing here. Oh yeah, good point. Um, so it, it, you will get a normal AA gradient with hypoventilation. Any other pathological problems, uh, you, will, you will see a, a deficiency such as fibrosis or whatnot, you will get a deficiency. And, but as you can see here, hypoventilation is just the, the sheer act of breathing. You'll still have a normal AA gradient. All right. Um, Right, this is just kind of the equilibration point of the ventilation perfusion. So it just tells you at what point it works best. I don't think they'll get into this too much. A lot of this is just more of, of the math, um, but obviously you wanna to come to a, uh, an efficient point to where perfusion matches ventilation and that's kind of where you're, where you're at um, in the lung. So between ribs two and three, that's about the point where it, it's, uh, you get maximal uh, gas exchange. All right. And again, these are posted for y'all to go through. I know I just, I don't want to, we still going to try to do renal. So um, it's just a lot. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Now here you could see if there's some sort of blockage in ventilation, right? How does that affect the perfusion? So the point is you're still getting blood flow, but you're not, there's no gas exchange because uh, you, you, you have no ventilation. Whereas here you could see the perfusion is messed up. So you're able to ventilate the system, but you can't perfuse blood. So it has to do with the, the ratios here. And again, this is like we were talking about earlier, the AA, the AA gradient is important clinically to be able to uh, um, diagnose the patient with especially restrictive lung diseases because you're not getting proper gas exchange. And remember, again, we said hypoventilation, uh, it's not gonna change your AA gradient. The amount of oxygen going in and, carb and carbon dioxide going out is going to be uh, the same, you're just breathing less. And this is just, if you're one of those people that likes graphs, you can uh, break it down, whether it's a shunt or some sort of mismatch. All right, high altitude, the, base, the basic, 
principle is that if you can increase your 2,3 BPG, you could increase your offloading, right? So over time, you could increase your EPO so you can make more red blood cells, but the whole goal is to be able to offload more to the tissues. And motion sick, uh, sorry, mountain sickness, uh, you just basically want to get the, the patient down the mountain as soon as possible because pulmonary edema can convert to cerebral edema for sure. Uh, and that's kind of what they get into there. Um, all right, let's try this one. Oh, so, turd, heard from a term too that 30% is calculations. Did we get a lot of calculations, Lindsay? Do you remember? I don't. If we did, they weren't. I don't that know bad. if I would say because 30%, that's a lot. I don't remember it's way it too being, much. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember it being that heavy on calculations. All right. Yeah, we'll do acid based stuff in renal because that's when it gets heavy on the acid based stuff. All right, so phosphoglycerate kinase, that's gonna be the one where, one of the two steps where you get um, ATP formation, right? Um, yeah, and y'all are gonna get into this way more later. So we'll just touch on it here. Um, hexokinase versus glucokinase. Did y'all even, did y'all talk about this yet? We Easter? briefly talk about glycolysis and CPR too, All right, but well, just, I'm pretty sure the only question they ask you is with respect to the substrate level phosphorylation, which is related to ATP. So just yeah. know that. Glu glucokinase is in the liver, hexokinase is in the tissues. So um, just for the sake of time, I, I don't think it's super important to go through this glycolysis stuff just because um, most of y'all have done this in undergrad. So this is just a very introduction to this. Y'all will get into this a lot more later. Um, I did put a star on this slide. These are the rate limiting steps. These are the steps that make ATP. And same thing here. All right, and that's when we talked about BPG earlier. All right, and you can see here, this is the process. We talked about that already. All right, same thing here. Um, yeah, y'all could read this on your own and that's the same thing we talked about before. So if they test y'all on anything, they might bring that into it as well. All right, um, this is just the process. Uh, what ends up happening with these cells is you get this imbalance. Is it, uh, sodium potassium ATPS is compromised and you end up getting uh, lysis of the red blood cell. Right, a little bit more. Yeah, I'm not gonna go through all this for the sake of time. This is kind of just introductory to what y'all are gonna do in heavy detail um, in DM. Glucose into red blood cells, right? Of course, that uses the glute transporters, this facilitated diffusion. Right, and make sure you know these, glute one's in the red blood cells, two's in the liver, four is uh, insulin dependent, which is true, right, and that was that, it has a higher KM so it can grab onto more um, in the liver, right, because you want to pick up all of the glucose you can. So these are just differences between what's in the liver and what is in the tissue. Met hemoglobin, we talked about that. The difference here is that remember iron is in the ferric state for met hemoglobin. So if that's the case, you're gonna have, you're not gonna be able to carry oxygen very well. You want iron in the ferrous state. All right. Um, Pyruvate kinase deficiency, right? Low affinity because, um, because you're gonna be having too much uh, two, three BPG, right? So if you have, elevated 2,3 BPG, uh, it's going to decrease the affinity for hemoglobin and oxygen. Same thing here. Fluoride. Uh, I think this was like one slide. Yeah, this is that step um, that they talked about. Right, uh, the fluoride process here. So no, that's an inhibitor. Uh, Right, doesn't sense it, so it's definitely visceral. 
uh, sensation, visceral afferent, right? Sensation in the bladder. So bladder is an organ, sensation is afferent, right? Y'all learn this. Right, so 14 is considered normal, right? 14 to 20 is eupnea. Read the test. Um, Y'all could do this on your own. I think you just use the equation, VD over VT. Yeah, this one. Figure that out. What happens on standing? Right, of course, you have your baroreceptors, so blood flow distribution when you stand up. Um, obviously, blood is uh, not insulin dependent, gravity dependent, right? <laughs> so, right, and it has the same thing in the lungs. That's why your perfusion in the lower aspect of the lungs is more than the upper aspect. So remember the taut form is gonna not accept oxygen when it's in the relaxed form, it's kind of opened up so it can uh, bind oxygen. But remember we said carbon dioxide. Um, right, so if it's binding carbon dioxide, it's not gonna wanna bind oxygen. So carbon dioxide is gonna be in the taut form. Whereas oxygen, when, it's, when it wants to bind, it'll be in the relaxed form. Again, that has to do with this curve. Carbon dioxide is gonna right shift, make more offloading, uh, and it'll be in the taut form. All right, we need to take a break. I'm half dead. Um, so, all right, so it's 2.40. Let's say we'll start at three. Does that sound good to everybody? 20 minutes, go grab something to eat. Sound good? All right, 20 minutes. Um, do you want to do the beginning, like the anatomy stuff? Yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started with this. Um, I know we kind of went through that last section a little fast. Um, if you need any clarification, you can always message us. But if you want to look at last term's um, review, you can. Last term, we split it up into two days. But tomorrow, we're doing a review for the April class. So we kind of had to get everything in today. So if, if you need any clarification, you could look at, um, at look, at, look at last terms or message us. But honestly, any of the math, any math stuff that they give you will be straightforward, like plug in, plug and play, right? Anything that you, uh, you know, uh, obviously no scratch paper and stuff. So it should be straightforward. All right. Okay, so going through the anatomy here, this is just kind of a basic overview of anatomy when you when we have these slides that are really busy I usually just get a general um, organization of everything but I don't spend too much time on here um, the biggest thing you do need to understand the inguinal the iliohypogastric ilioinguinal I'm pretty sure that was big anything associated with the kidneys, but um, they, I don't know if this was big in term one, but they're retroperitoneal, the kidneys, they're retroperitoneal, meaning um, they are kind of outside of the, you, you can actually kind of see this here, they're outside of the normal um, abdominal cavity. Okay. Hold on, I think I can, Hey. Oh. Yeah. yeah, you have to. Oh, man. It may make me. Hold on. It should just ask you to approve it. Yeah, yeah. Let me see something real quick. I'm trying to control the screen <laughs> so he doesn't have to. It may make me uh, shut down Zoom. So we'll see. Hold on. Really? Maybe, maybe not. All right. You Wait, I'm controlling. It says I'm controlling your screen now. Get out of here. 
You sliding in my DMs? Gotta watch out. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay, now I'm controlling your screen. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so they are bean-shaped organs, retroperitoneal, I said that, extending from T12 to L2. That's not a huge thing. The biggest thing to know is that the right kidney is slightly lower due, the, due to the presence of the liver. That could come into play um, with just the levels of the, at the vertebrae, but um, this is all really just an overview. Adrenals are on the top. Adrenals come more into play in term two in ER, but that's the basic overview of this. Um, some key anatomy, you'll see it has a thick cortex and then, and then the medulla, and then they are going to empty into these K, to the renal pelvis or the calyces and then to the renal pelvis, and then it goes into a ureter. Um, and um, this is going to come into play a lot with the histo. You'll get a few histo questions on that, um, but the, just know the overall how they drain. So the medulla then to cortex into the calyces and then the hilus and then to the ureter. The functions, um, they have some endocrine functions. So erythropoietin, this stimulates the bone marrow for production of red blood cells. So this can, um, this is going to happen at the level of the kidneys. Renin, this comes into a lot of um, play in ER, but we'll talk a lot about renin here because this is the RAS system, R-A-A-S, renin, angiotensin, um, aldosterone system or something like that. This is very important with regulating blood pressure and blood volume. So we're going to talk about that later in this review, but this is a major, major, major thing, the RAS system. And then hydroxylates, um, its role with vitamin D, this is also important, but the biggest thing here, term one in CPR two is the RAS system. So circle that, highlight it, you need to understand this system. Then homeostasis, of course, it's secreting waste products. It has a big, big, big role in water and electrolyte balance and then acid base balance. These two kind of um, go together in how they're regulated in, in, and their importance for the system. And we are going to go over that in great detail today. So the blood supply, um, it is important that you know this. There is a difference between the um, blood supply and the venous drainage of the right versus the left kidney. Um, so this renal artery, segmental, interlobar, arcuate. So go through this. Please make sure that you know this. Um, with respect to the drainage, I don't know if there's another slide on this, but there's a difference between left and right. And so you need to understand that. Um, well, I'm assuming that we have something about that, but left versus right venous drainage is different from the kidneys. Do you want to do embryology? You don't need it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So with the embryology, um, I think we've mentioned this before. I'm going to mention to you, it to you again. When you are talking about embryology, the way I study embryology at SGU is I actually start from the very um, end of the presentation and work my way backwards. The reason being, they are going to test you mostly on the pathology of the embryology. So what can go wrong? That's going to be about 90% of the embryo questions that you are going to get. The other like 10 to 15% of embryo questions are going to be what comes from what. And a lot of that is going to be mostly like neural crest cells or stuff like that. So when you're going through embryology, make sure that you um, understand if, if, if you don't want to go through it all, which I actually don't go through it all, um, start at the back, memorize the pathologies, and then you can go through and pick out what comes from what in the big um, precursor. So most of it develops from the intermediate mesoderm and urogenital sinus. That is important. So intermediate mesoderm, you can see that here. Um, and then you have the lateral mesoderm. So this is just showing you the differences. And so right now we're focusing on the intermediate, intermediate mesoderm, which is between paraxial and lateral mesoderm. I pointed out the lateral mesoderm and extends along the dorsal body wall of the embryo. So just remember, later, um, intermediate mesoderm for the kidneys. 
So the development, pronephros, mesonephros, metanephros, this is kind of an, um, it's, it's a process. So it goes from one to the other to the other. So you start out with the pronephros, which is the rudinary non-functional kidney. And then it actually starts way up here in the, um, really, really high up in the system. But as it goes as you developed, it's actually going to come down here. So pronephros, then mesonephros, and then metanephros at the very end. So just understand that this right here, this is just the process, like step one, step two, step three, it starts up really high. And then as you get to the functional permanent kidney, it's going to settle down into its final resting place um, in the lower lumbar area. Yeah, so metanephros is the permanent kidney. So that's kind of the end stage right there. Um, a couple of things that you should notice here that are going to be associated with pathologies, the yolk stock is one of them. Um, that actually comes more into play in DM. The alointus is another one and the, the urogenital sinus and clauca. So those are going to be associated with some pathologies later on. So the metanephros, remember, this is kind of the end stage where you're getting that permanent functional kidney, appears in the fifth week. Remember, dates aren't the a huge, huge thing that you want to focus on. It's mainly what comes from what and then what can happen if something goes wrong. And so uteric, so, but this is important, the uteric bud and outgrowth of the mesonephric duct close to its attachment to the clo. I can't say that, clauca, cloica, I don't know. Um, but this bud is going to penetrate into this tissue, molded over by a cap and um, from the surrounding mesoderm. So this is, if I remember correctly, this is what is gonna start that actual kidney development. So it's that bud that's growing into the mesonephric duct um, or the metanephric tissue and then um, it's going to keep budding and growing and you are going to get this, um, the actual development of the permanent kidneys. So it is important that you understand that there are two different um, the, um, origins here. So the renal bud, so remember this bud right here is going to be the primitive renal pelvis and it's going to split into a caudal stock in the cranial portion. This is the collecting tubules. Yes, this is important that you know that the collecting tubules originate from this bud, which is from the mesonephric duct. So remember the mesonephric duct, that's going to form um, the permanent, it, um, permanent kidneys. It buds out into the metanephric tissue. And this is what is the collecting ducts in the rebal pelvis. So there's a difference between the collecting ducts and the rest of the nephron. That's very important. Please make a note of that on your slides and your mind that there are two different um, embryonic, embryonic origins when you're looking at the nephron here. So that's a big, big, big thing. That's the main takeaway from this slide. So use a nephric duct, bud grows into the metanephric tissue, but this right here is the collecting uh, duct, renal um, pelvis, and then that's going to go to the ureters. And then the rest of the kidney is going to, the rest of the nephron unit is going to be um, of a different origin. So um, I briefly talked about this, the renal ascent um, and rotation. So you have this descending pattern when you're getting to the mesonephros, but then you have the actual renal ascent. So you're going up and then you're rotating. And this actually causes a lot of pathology. So this is super important. So there, the kidneys are initially located in the pelvis and there, as the growth of the abdomen happens, you get the ascension of the kidneys. Um, and then, so initially the hilum is gonna face ventral and receive branches from the comic iliac. Um, but as it keeps going, as it keeps going, it's going to rotate 90 degrees, rotate medially almost 90 degrees. And so that's important to understand for later pathology. So this slide is mainly conceptual. Just understand there is an ascent of the kidneys starting in the pelvis, going to more of the lumbar region. And then you're going to have that 90 degree rotation for the kidneys to rest in their final place, retroperitoneal in the lumbar region. This remember conceptual, just understand this because there is pathology associated with it. 
So the adult kidneys and related structures, again, this is a busy slide. Just please under, um, understand where they're located. The rest of this on here, I don't know if I really paid attention to. Okay, so renal agenesis. Now we're getting into those pathologies. So this is early degeneration or failure of formation of the uteric bud. This is going to be your big term here that I want you to remember. So anytime they describe the um, pathology, this is what you need to put in your head because this is probably how they're going to test it. You can also go into the Gray's Anatomy book and they will probably, the phrases that they use with these things, please memorize those because um, and that is how they can um, ask these questions. But um, so you're going to have a unilateral, more um, more common in boys, left kidneys, usually the absent one, asymptomatic. So all of this is really just conceptual that you can find in, in, um, in a vignette. Now, this is really important right here because if you have a bilateral agenesis, then you're going to get oligodramnios, remember, because you aren't filtering pulmonary hypoplasia. So these two always go together. If you have renal agenesis, you are probably going to have pulmonary hypoplasia. Just associate that with your, in your head. So agen renal agenesis, oligodramnios, and then pulmonary hypoplasia. Those three are uh, um, associated with each other. Then Potter sequence, and then this is incompatible with postnatal life. So this oligodramnios is something that you are going to be able to see in, um, during the gestational period and which is associated. So know this oligodramnios pulmonary hypoplasia because what they might tell you, they might give you the presentation of this patient um, or it would be in utero because it's incompatible with life, but you can see that they'll they'll say, they diagnose it with renal agenesis then they'll say, what, did, what could you also see in this patient? oligohydramnios and then pulmonary hypoplasia are two big, big, big ones that they could ask you. But of course they can ask you all of these, but just know that um, they'll probably expect you to know what is associated with this renal agenesis. Yeah, early degeneration or failure of the formation of the uteric bud. That is huge right here. Remember that uteric bud that goes into the metanephric tissue. Bifid ureters and supernumerary kidneys. So. The bifid ureter is the biggest thing you need to understand here. Um, so the, um, yeah, so if you have a supernumerary kidney, so extra, extra kidney, um, it's going to have a separate ureter. Um, one uteric bud could divide and induce the formation of two kidneys. So that's, it's just the, um, more than one uteric bud on one side. That's the biggest thing. So we're differentiating here. So if you see this, there are two different uteric buds attaching to the bladder, whereas this one, this is a bifid ureter. A bifid ureter is a big thing. I'm pretty sure you guys have a, um, and what's it called? There's a there's an x-ray image with um, dye, I believe, that shows a bifid ure ureter somewhere, but it's early versus complete division of one of the ureteric buds. That's the biggest, biggest thing here. Horseshoe kidney, fusion of the lower poles right here while it's still in the renal pelvis. So you have the uteric bud formation, but you have fusion of the lower poles. Remember this have the initial uteric bud formation is in the pelvic. So it's still in the pe pelvis and then you can't ascend. And the reason you can't ascend is because of this inferior mesenteric artery. It really just provides an obstruction to the ascent. So it um, it's a mechanical um obstruction, you can't go up there. So um, you would probably see an x-ray or something. I don't know, maybe a CT, but just know that this is fusion of the lower poles and then it's interrupted by the inferior mesenteric artery. Renal coverings, this is very important. Please, please, please um, star this. We have it starred for you. Um, so the, the thing that you guys need to understand here are the different fascia. So peritoneal fats, the renal fascia, the grotose fascia, um, pararenal fats, 
because there can be like, for example, hematomas or abscesses that are localized to different regions. You'll notice that there are all of the differences here. It forms essentially barriers right here. And so depending on where a, an abscess or tumor or um, hematoma is, it can be localized to different areas and that is going to inform what it actually does for the pathology there. So please make a note of that and understand which one is the closest to the kidney and which one is the farthest from the kidney. Yeah, so perirenal fat, peri perirenal fat, and then the renal fascia. Those are your three big ones there. So um, know which is closest, which is farthest. Hepatorenal recess. So um, this is superior to the right kidney, posterior to the liver. So this is, um, the big thing here is fluid, um, fluid accumulation. And this is also called the pouch of Morrison. And so if a person is laying supine, fluid is going to collect in the, hepato, in the hepatorenal recess. Um, please know the both of the names, the pouch of Morrison and hepatorenal, they'll probably put hepatorenal on the exam. Um, but the biggest thing is if you are, if a patient is supine, fluid is going to collect here. Pain from the kidneys and the ureters. This is a big, big, big thing. Um, so pain from the kidneys is referred pain. So we're going to refer to the Planck's inguinal region, groin, scrotum. Um, so the classic loin to groin type distribution. So for example, if a, a classic presentation of, for example, a kidney stone, um, especially men, when they come into the emergency department, they actually feel pain in their groin or testicular region. And that's the pain from the kidney. It's that referred pain. So why does that happen? It's the sympathetic supplied by T11, T12. So visceral afferents along, um, that are going, carrying visceral afferent fibers going back to the spinal cord. So it's those, those visceral afferents that you're always going to associate with the pain. So higher levels of these fibers radiate near the um, UPJ, lower levels UVJ. So understand that it's the sympathetics um, visceral afferents traveling with the sympathetics from T12 to L2. Um, so referred pain along this distribution, um, ilioinguinal versus iliohypogastric, that is a thing. I'm pretty sure you guys went over that in MSK. Um, I'm pretty sure that was a thing in MSK that you um, differentiated between, but please understand the difference between those. So ilioinguinal, skin over medial thigh, upper scrotal labial areas, iliohypogastric, skin over anterior abdominal muscles, pubic symph symphysis, that is very important that you understand that. Um, so this is the little trick that we like to use, female pelvis water under the bridge. What that means is the ureter is being crossed over by the uterine vessels. The reason why that's important, it... Sorry, I pressed the button. <laughs> I don't know. Hold on. Sorry. Got to see. Or was it here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So the biggest thing, why is this important? Surgery. So if you are going in for a surgical procedure, you need to under, um, it's kind of hard to tell some of these structures sometimes. And so you know that if the ureter is being crossed over by the uterine vessels, for example, if you are doing um, an oophorectomy, you're taking out that ovary, you want to cut the uterine vessels, but you don't want to cut the ureter. And so water under the bridge, the ureter is going to be deep to that. So the biggest thing there is um, surgical relevance. Um, same here, water under the bridge. Um, really, again, that's just important to know it anatomically for surgical purposes. Um, constrictions, these are very important because this is where you can find, um, this, this is where kidney stones can get lodged. So uridopelvic junction, um, 
And then another one where the ureter crosses over the iliac artery, and that is at the location near the bifurcation um, to the external and internal iliac, and then the uretovesicular junction. So again, this is important clinically because um, renal stones can get lodged in these places because these are constrictions. So this is just um, going off that again. So you need to know where the constrictions are. So this is the uteropelvic one, or I think that's the uteropelvic. Urical birth defects. Remember how I mentioned you need to know um, different points. This is why. So if the lumen is partially disintegrated, it can form a urical cyst or urical sinus. The difference between these two is the, um, the presentation, uh, like the physical presentation, and then what the discharge is like. So, um, or it can be official if it remains complete completely patent. So please understand the difference between these three. Um, a fistula, you get, um, I think you get urine out of the opening, the, ure the urethral sinus. Um, I don't remember what that discharge is, but um, know the difference between these three. And it's just, it, it's how it disintegrates. That's the biggest thing. Clinical anatomy. So um, biggest thing here, bladder is going to be in front of the uterus and um, you need to pay attention to the recto uterine pouch. That is going to be the biggest thing on this slide. So recto uterine pouch and then the association of the bladder versus the uterus where each are with relation to each other. This is also called the pouch of Douglas. So remember when we said the hepatorenal recess is, when, is where fluid is going to collect when a patient is supine. This is going to be the pouch that um, does the collection when a person is standing. And how do you express fluid from this region, you do a coldocentesis. And so you'll notice if you look in the vaginal canal, this posterior fornix right here, this is a direct access point, a fairly easy direct access point to the recto uterine pouch. And so the coldocentesis, I'm pretty sure we have a slide in a minute, you can actually um, put the needle over here. You can go through the posterior um, area right here and you can directly access the um, rectal uterine pouch and you can drain fluid. So for an example, an abscess. So if, you know, um, a classic presentation is a woman coming in, they've had a fever for a while, they have, a, um, you know, signs, clinical signs of infection, they do an ultrasound or a CT and they find this abscess developing and how would you drain this abscess or where would it be? So rectal uterine pouch and then coldocentesis. Okay, urinary bladder innervation. So you do need to understand the difference between these. So the sensation of filling, stretch, these are the visceral afferents accompanying parasympathetic. So that makes sense because, um, and so the pelvic splanchnics, this is big right here, visceral afferents with the pelvic splanchnics and then the sympathetics, then contraction of the detrusion muscle, parasympathetic. So this might be weird that you're getting contraction with the parasympathetics, but um, the reason this is happening is because you are keeping... Um, because you know the rest and digest phase, the parasympathetics are going to control the contraction of the detressor muscle. The internal sphincter, this is sympathetics, um, contract and then parasympathetics relax. So make sure you know, understand the difference between these two right here. So one is going to allow for urine to collect into the bladder and to keep it there. One is going to allow for the release. So it's, um, you know, if you are running away from somebody, you, you know, you want one thing versus if you're resting and digest, you want another thing. So that's why sympathetics or parasympathetic, it's, it's different here. And then the external sphincter, this is somatic efferent. So remember somatics, these are all voluntary. Anything that's a somatic, it's a voluntary control. So you can actually control the external sphincter, but internal sphincter sympathetics are gonna contract. So this means that you are going to be able to void, um, no, to keep it in, the parent sympathetics are gonna relax. So you're gonna be able to void um, 
and then this parasympathetics, the detressor muscle, and then sensation of filling. So the, remember, this is a visceral sensation. So it's visceral afferents traveling with the pelvic splate mix. There we go. Okay, female urethra, these are goal. Um, okay, so this is under urethral sphincter. This is what we were talking about in the previous slide. Females approximately, the urethra approximately four centimeters. It's shorter, that's why females get um, UTIs commonly. And then external urethral, yeah. Uh, orifice opens to the vestibule of the vagina. But the biggest thing here is that um, ascending UTIs are common because it's short and it it's in very close proximity here. And so um, it is very easy for a bac for bacteria to get in here, take hold, and then ascend. And so you get a ur urinary tract infection. Um, and then again, the innervation, we talked about that on the previous slide. Male urethra, um, there are multiple sections of the male urethra. So prostatic, of course, is in, in the midst of the prostate gland. And then immediately underneath, and this is kind of hard to tell, and you'll get into this in a lot in ER. This is kind of hard to tell on a... Um, on an image because it's such a short period. So it's immediately after the prosthetic urethra. This is the membrous urethra, a deep perineal pouch. Um, I don't remember that being a thing here um, in term one, it was definitely a thing in term two, but you probably good to know. And then um, penile spongy urethra. So if there is a Foley catheterization, um, this bend right here you see, this is very dangerous because if you aren't careful, you can actually puncture this and you can cause um, a lot of damage here. And so that's a big thing that you need to watch out for there. Polycystic kidney disease. This is a um, an inherited autosomal dominant disease or autosomal recessive. Um, just kind of understand that this um, kind of exists and it causes multiple cysts throughout the kidneys, which are going to severely, severely impact renal function. Renal transplant um, is, uh, I feel weird talking about this. Do you want to talk about it? You're sitting sure. there with Grin on your face. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually had a, a kidney transplant like two years ago. Um, I was on dialysis for a while, and uh, the idea of going to med school was very bleak. But uh, my aunt came forward and donated her kidney. I actually had polycystic kidney disease. I was in, like I said, renal failure. So I was blessed enough to get uh, a kidney donation, and this is exactly how they did it. So um, yeah, they went in through my abdomen and they attached my, the donated kidney. Um, to my iliac vessels right there. So um, everything's going well. I feel uh, I feel like my old self again, for sure. Uh, very blessed for that. Um, I, I could pick up from here. talking about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You are definitely the subject matter expert on that. It just felt weird. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was, I was, I was sick for a very long time. So um, it's definitely uh, a blessing for sure. Um, I, you could, you want me to pick up or you want to go? It doesn't matter. It, whatever you uh, want. It's fine. Sure. Okay. So stress and kindness just kind of means over time, it's just, uh, over time, it's very difficult to, um, control just because of, uh, just weakness of the muscles. A lot of times, uh, post-pregnancy, postpartum, you can get, um, uh, certain, uh, weakening of the, the musculature and, um, uh, so you can get this incontinence or inability, inability to hold your urine back. Cystocele um, is just, just here. Um, it's just a prolapse, right? So a uh, prolapse of the, the bladder into the vaginal canal, right? So um, uh, you, you can just act, um, correct that surgically. All right. So the... Um, I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Uh, the uh, stress incontinence happens in, uh, uh, for females only, right? No, not necessarily. I mean, I think it's more common in, in females just because it's a postpartum thing. But, um, you know, if a guy has some sort of prostatic surgery, you know, that could definitely happen as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So I don't want y'all to get too bogged down with the histology. What we're going to do, the way I have this set up is we're just going to work through the nephron and I'm going to point out what you need to know. Um, 
at the different sections. Um, so uh, you know, like, and the, the important part about learning this now for you guys is that in term four, you get into a lot of the, the medications, the diuretics they use uh, to keep fl fluid volume under control. So if you see here, this is where we start. This is the glomerulus. So think of this as like, it, it's, it's a tuft of capillaries. Capillaries is what they say. So um, it's basically like a filter system, right? Just like your Brita filter. So the blood goes in and then a certain amount of blood gets pushed through the filter. Now, certain particles don't get through that are too big or that are charged and stuff. But uh, the idea is that you could filter blood through, you could filter toxins through, uh, specifically urea um, that you could go through. Um, so uh, this tuft of capillaries, uh, then after the blood gets filtered through there, it goes into the urinary system. And then we go through the proximal tubule, uh, through the loop of Henle and... Um, Tuft of cap, cap. Brady, your audio went out. Oh shoot. Okay, now we can it's hear you. You're at your you your um it switched uh -huh. over your audio. It's different now. It should be back now. I don't know why. Okay, now it's back. All right. So you can see here, this is that tuft of capillaries. <clears throat> so you can see the blood goes through here. It's filtered through this point, and that's where it goes into Bo Bowman space, and that's technically the urinary system. So from then, it goes down into the urinary system, and you get this countercurrent exchange, which I know is a very difficult concept to understand, but they don't really test it. The, the whole light, well, we'll get to it in a little bit, but let's focus on the histology right now. So this is a good picture. Note that um, I think it has something coming up too, that juxtaglomerular apparatus, the JGA cells, kind of sits next to it, and that helps to regulate your renin. But we're gonna talk about renin in detail by the time we're done. Um, if you had any concerns about it, I'm sure we can we can uh, figure it all out. Um, so here you can see these these are those podocytes. So this is actually that little barrier uh, that uh, all the blood is filtered through. So again, uh, big particles like albumin and stuff like that shouldn't get through in, unless there's some sort of severe kidney damage. Uh, then uh, larger larger proteins will get through. But your urine should be sterile. There should be no bacteria. There should be no protein in it. But if there is, that could be a sign of some sort of kidney failure. And again, here you can kind of look at this, certain things that are charged, uh, certain things that are too large and even uh, shapes can't get through. So obviously you shouldn't have blood in your urine either, right? Hematuria. So this is, uh, it's, uh, it, those are all gonna be kept in the blood, but the things that you wanna get out, particularly toxins, excess sodium, excess water can get through. All right, so again, uh, so what we're gonna look at here, okay, so the main thing to be able to differentiate when you look at these H&E slides is the proximal convoluted tubule versus the distal convoluted tubule. So we'll start with the proximal one, the one that's closest to um, the glomerulus. So uh, th it's this right here. So what I want you to note is that there's a lot of cells here. There's a lot of nuclei, okay? compared to this one, which we'll get to in a little bit. But just keep in mind this, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. We're actually looking at this one. Um, this one right here is the proximal convoluted tube. So you could see very sparse nuclei and you could see, they call this like a dirty lumen, okay? Which is just, I don't, it's not good, right? But it's just sparse. Um, you could see sparse cells uh, around and, um, here again, you can see it. These cells are sparse. You got a dirty lumen in there. And um, if you come over here, um, you could kind of see them right here, these sparse cells coming through here. So that's what you want to notice when you look at these uh, cells. There are going to be a lot more of these compared to the distal convoluted tubule. So if you look, you could see um, this is a proximal convoluted tubule. This is a proximal um, this is probably a distal. You can see there's more cells. So I'll be able to point it out uh, as we go along. Um, okay, so now we're getting into the uh, loop of Henley, that loop that comes around. So um, I think the best way to do this is the, 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 the loop of Henley that we're looking at is very clear, okay? So if they point this out to you and they show you this clear area, that's gonna be the loop of Henley. It has a countercurrent exchange with the blood supply that's next to it. That's called the vasa recta. The way you can identify the vasa recta is it has red blood cells in it, right? Because it's vasculature. So if you look here and you see this empty space, that's going to be your loop of Henle, and then uh, the vasa recta runs next to it. Okay. 
uh, and that's how you get this countercurrent exchange. So again, um, see here, this is our loop of Henle, and you see here is our vasa recta. Okay, and we'll talk about what this is in just a second. All right, um, and again, the vasa recta, a little bit more difficult here, but um, you can kind of see it there. Um, yeah, but if they give it to you on the exam, it'll be very clear that they have the red blood cells in it, but you could kind of see them. This is just a different stain, some sort of trichrome stain. All right, again, so loop of Henle is the very clear area running right next to it should be the vasa recta, okay? It's gonna run down. So we went through the proximal convoluted tube. Remember it has sparse nuclei around it, maybe like five. And we get down, now we're down in here and we're looking at this counter current exchange system, right? Between the urine and, um, and the vasa recta, right? The urine and the blood supply. Uh, quick question. Uh, yeah. Can you ask us to differentiate between uh, uh, descending and ascending loop of Henley or thick? No. No, there's, yeah, no, it's really difficult if, it, if you could even do that. Uh, they wouldn't do that. The um, difference, okay. the only difference is their functional difference, honestly, not their histological difference. It's the different, it's the um, permeability between solids and water. Hold on a second. She's scratching awesome. at the door. No, Phoebe. Yeah, so Come histologically, on. you will not be asked to um, differentiate, just you need to know that descending versus ascending is impermeant to either water or solutes. Yeah, we'll and that's the counter current exchange thing. Yeah. All right. So now we're getting to the distal convoluted tube, right? And you could see that this one is the one that's more cellular, right? Opposed to having like five, five nuclei, you could see there's a bunch, there's eight to 10, right? So that's how you're going to be able to differentiate those. So there's smaller cells and there's more nuclei visible, okay? So if we were to try to point some out here, try to find some good ones. So like this sparse one here, proximal convoluted tubule, this is a proximal, um, right? Sparse cells. This one looks like a distal convoluted tubule. Look at all the nuclei around it, right? So again, you're gonna see this ratio um, more proximal to distal. So I think beyond that, just straight up identifying it, I don't think they'll really um, ask you too much. Like this is a good distal convoluted tube right there. You see all the cells there. Um, so yeah, I don't think they'll do anything beyond that. Now the macula densa, <clears throat> that's kind of where this, these JGA cells are. So it's gonna be able to uh, regulate, not regulate, but um, um, it's gonna be able to sense the, the uh, sodium concentration. So the macula densa being able to do that then according to the amount of salt you have, can, it, it's an uh, indirect way of measuring how much volume you have, right? So if it's very salty or you know, um, it has a lot, it's hypernatremic, then you're probably dehydrated, right? So it could tell the, uh, the JGA cells to release um, renin and then you could bring up your, your blood pressure, right? And well, we'll talk about that again in a second, but just make note that this macula densa always uh, sits up close to it, but what they're actually pointing to is the distal convoluted tubule. So the macula densa runs right next to it. It's like part of the distal convoluted tubule or like right in between it. So uh, that's why they always run next to each other. So you could see the distal convoluted tubule uh, and the macula densa right next to it. All right, so super important. Um, this is like one of those things that's like very important clinically because they use medications to help uh, not only with heart failure, but with kidney failure, regulating blood pressure, just regulating edema um, and, um, and, and your, your, your volume levels. Um, they use medications that'll help to regulate this. So what happens here is if the body senses that you have low volume or low blood pressure, low blood pressure correlates with low volume, it can secrete renin, okay? Renin is going to do two things. It's going to secrete angiotensin or this pathway where you go from angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. This enzyme ACE actually, for whatever reason, comes from the lungs. But it's going to, the important thing is that it's going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is very active. It tenses, right? Angiotensin. It tenses the vessels. Great name for it. So it's going to help to. Uh, in a, in a, in a, 
in a setting where you have low volume or low blood pressure, it's going to squeeze down on the vessels and bring up your blood pressure, right? It's going to get blood to your brain. And you're good to go. Now, also what renin is going to do is it's going to, um, uh, it's going to activate aldosterone. Now, what aldosterone does is it tells uh, the, the nephron to, to bring water back, to hold on to water, I'm sorry, to hold on to sodium, right? And by holding on to sodium, you hold on to water because wherever sodium goes, water goes, right? So the, the process of using uh, aldosterone is it's going to tell the nephron to bring back the sodium. You use a sodium potassium pump. So every time you bring in sodium, you end up peeing out potassium. But that's just a sacrifice that needs to be made in order to bring up your volume, okay? So we'll talk about that again uh, in a second when, uh, when we get there. All right, now, uh, again, when we look at the collecting duct, yeah, this is a better picture. Um, so whereas we talked about this, look how clean this lumen is, right? This uh, thin or thick ascending limb, uh, it's very clean. So you can identify that right here. We said the vasor rect that is the red, you could see the um, red blood cells there. Now, if you're asked to talk about the collecting duct, if they point to it, that's gonna be the dirty lumen, right? Whereas this thin ascending limb right here is very clean. Uh, the vasor recta has the red blood cells. If they point to a long one like this, uh, the dirty lumen, it's gonna be the collecting duct. So that's just quick quick and easy ways to understand those. Um, beyond that, I don't think they'll really ask you anything. I think I blew that picture up. Yeah, so look, so dirty lumen, collecting duct, right next to it, thin ascending limb, anywhere you see red blood cells, vasor rectum, right? So you can identify uh, proximal convoluted tube view. The clear duct is the thin ascending limb. Yeah, right, or thick or thin. It's that, that complex of loop of Henley. That's all you need to know, right? Vasor rectus, red blood cell, dirty lumens, collecting duct. So now you can identify proximal convoluted tube view versus distal convoluted tube view, right? Those are the circles. Proximal has a few nuclei, distal has a bunch. Um, no, okay. Uh, so don't think of the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. Don't, don't use the lumen for that, just use the nuclei. So for proximal convoluted tubule, you're gonna have like five nuclei, right? They're kind of sparse. Um, so like this right here, just a few nuclei. Right, so don't use the lumen because it, it's not really reliable. Um, but yeah, so that's proximal. And remember distal convoluted tubule, you're gonna have a lot of nuclei here, okay? So use nuclei for that. <clears throat> when you get to the loops, right, then you could use the lumen because this lumen will differentiate the collecting tubule from the loop of Henle, which is the clear one, okay? Now, so that's all you're gonna to have to identify for that. That should be straightforward. Um, now, when we get to the urinary system, the, the, the one thing I want you to take away is that this transitional epithelium, this is the only place you're gonna see it is in the urinary system, right? So that's important to know. Uh, you could see this is the ureter. So it has like this stellate shape or the star shape, um, but basically it allows urine to pass through, but there is some musculature there. Um, I doubt they give you a picture of that. It, it's, super straightforward. What is important here is um, um, this is uh, the, the transitional epithelium here and it has what's called these dome cells. And all that means is that when the bladder is distended, like these dome cells kind of spread out, right? Then when they do that, it, it lets the bladder distend. So when it's collapsed down, um, when it's empty, the, the cells kind of dome up. That's what they call them. And um, if that helps you identify it, then that's good. But that's that transitional ep epithelium. Urethra, again, as Lindsay was saying, y'all are gonna get more into this in reproductive. Um, so we won't get into that too much, but obviously the urethra goes from the bladder uh, out the body. All right, so let's get into some of this. GFR is the main component. So when you people when people are in renal failure, uh, they always want to know what the GFR is, right? How well can you filter the blood? So the degree is basically linear to the degree of uh, renal failure correlates to your degree of GFR or, or the loss of GFR. 
So this is a good way to calculate it. Um, uh, it has to do with a lot with the filtration pressure, but we'll get to that in a second. This is a super important slide. Um, so, uh, and it's gonna come up again and again because they talk about this in a lot of different contexts, especially in liver failure, stuff like that. So what you need to understand is that there are two types of forces that we're gonna talk about um, for the vessel versus the interstitial. Interstitial meaning outside the vessel, right? You have, high, let's go inside the vessel. You have hydrostatic pressure, which is the pressure of fluid. Now, if you're inside the vessel, the hydrostatic pressure is gonna be the force outward, right? Outside the vessel, it's gonna be pushing fluid out, okay? There's also inside the vessel an oncotic pressure, okay? That's the proteins that are actually in the fluid. It has a pulling effect, okay? So in the vessel, you have hydrostatic pressure going out and oncotic pressure holding stuff in. Okay, the hydrostatic pressure that pushes out is gonna push it into the interstitial outside. So if you have high blood pressure or you have a lot of your fluid overloaded, uh, that hydrostatic pressure can overwhelm the system and push, uh, push fluid out of the vessel. That's a problem. What also can happen is if you have liver failure and you're not making proteins, you don't have a very good oncotic pressure in the vessel, which means you don't have a good pulling effect, right? So all the, the hydrostatic pressure is gonna overwhelm the oncotic pressure, right? The forces to go out are gonna be more than the forces to hold in because you don't have plasma proteins, right? That's one of the major component or the major uh, reasons we have albumin is to hold that pulling pressure, that protein pressure to keep stuff in the vessel, okay? If y'all remember the um, Kwashiorkor's disease, right? You see these kids with the big, the ascites or the big uh, stomach. The reason they have that is because they have protein malnutrition. They're not making albumin. So in their vessels, there's no oncotic pulling pressure to keep it in the vessel. All the pressure is hydrostatic going out, okay? That's why they get this big ascites. It's all this interstitial fluid. Now, outside the vessel, you have the same forces, okay? In the interstitium, you have hydrostatic pressure, which is pushing fluid from the interstitium back into the vessel. And you also have protein or oncotic pressure on the outside, uh, okay, holding stuff in the interstitium. So you have both a hydrostatic out going out of the vessel and a hydrostatic going into the vessel. You have an oncotic pulling from inside the vessel and an oncotic pulling from outside the vessel. So all of this is going to help regulate um, uh, this process of being able to filter, uh, not filter, but regulate how much blood stays in the vessel versus outside. So it's very important that you understand what this baseline, what this means before you start getting into the pathology behind it. All right, and this is, um, I think there's different ways of doing this equation. This is the way I like to do it because you could do um, hydrostatic minus hydrostatic and oncotic minus oncotic. There's different ways to do it, but I like it this way and it's all negative signs too. So it's easier for me. This, sometimes they, if they don't give you this, you assume this is one, this is a constant, and this is also a constant here. So if they give you, if they don't give you that, you assume it's one. But other than that, I find this is the easiest way to do it. I think it's different in your notes, but uh, you could, you know, rework it out. It's all, it all works out the same. It's just, I like it this way. It's all negatives. That's how first aid has it. Okay, so. Uh, and then we talk about the different pressures in regards to the kidney, but it's the same thing, right? You're still going to get this hydrostatic pressure pushing out versus this oncotic pressure going, uh, holding stuff in. And this goes along the same lines. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a little bit different. Um, this isn't the whole equation, but you could see they, they do it differently. Um, it's just rearranging stuff, but it all works out the same. So whatever floats your boat. And here we go. So look at this guy with uh, nephrotic syndrome. So very similar to uh, um, kwashiorkors, where kwashiorkors is a protein malnutrition. Nephrotic syndrome means you're peeing out a lot of proteins. If you're peeing out a lot of proteins, you don't have that oncotic pressure that's holding fluid in the vessels. <clears throat> so most of the fluid is going to just leave the vessels, right? And that's why you get all this fluid in the interstitium or outside the vessels. Okay, um, when we talk about um, kidney stones, obviously you can see this dilated ureter, um, cholelithiasis, 
the fact cholelithesis, <laughs> sorry, um, is what it's called. And uh, it's just a blockage, right? So anywhere it's a blockage, it's important that you can identify these. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll have patients do a barium swab. Hold on, Coley, it's it should be renal lithiasis. I, uh, I noticed this, it, no, this is in the SG slide. Cholelithiasis is a gallstone. The, pre, the prefix choli is referring to the gallstone. So this should say renal lithiasis. I'm pretty, pretty, pretty positive about that because that annoyed me in the note. I'm going to look this up real quick. I think it just means stone. Okay. Yeah, let me know. Um, yeah, it's gallstones. Cholelithiasis goes gallstone. So that's just a mishap on the slide look, so it's not look, it should say renal lithiasis yeah but it, look up look up a, i think there's some lithiasis is stone coli right, is gallstone nef, is gall is it nephrothiasis it should be reno lithiasis reno i think it's nef, nephrothiasis nephro, no nef, yeah maybe no anybody nephrolithiasis yeah thank cool you. thanks crystal <laughs> crystal knows what's up <laughs> all right yeah sorry okay, i just so i just wanted to correct that because when i when i was in term one and i saw this it just it drove me crazy oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's all stones at the end of the day um, <laughs> um okay yeah so question if um if hydrostatic is pushing stuff out would nephrotic syndrome be an increase in hydrostatic pressure it's not exactly an increase in hydrostatic pressure. It's a decrease in oncotic pressure. So if you were looking, let me pull up the thing if it lets me. Come on, there you go. So if you were looking at it like this, right? Um, the, the hydrostatic pressure is pushing stuff out, right? The, um, the oncotic pressure is holding stuff in. So if you have um, if you have a protein like the product syndrome where you're peeing out a lot of proteins, this arrow holding stuff in is it's much less, right? So you have you you're not really increasing hydrostatic pressure. You're you're increasing the delta, like the change, right? It's, it stays the same, but you're decreasing the oncotic pressure, right? So don't, I don't want you to get confused because they'll put A, B, C, and D and put like you're increasing hydrostatic pressure, but you're not really. It's staying the same. It's just that you don't have that pulling force from the, the proteins inside the vessel. All right, so, right, nephrolithiasis, right? Point being, you can get calcium stone, you can get uh, urea, urea stones, all kinds of stones. They're painful um, and you could, uh, and, and they, they cause blockages. The main thing to remember is what Lindsay was talking about earlier, the three points of interest for these constriction points, right? So the, the uretopelvic junction, the point where the ureter crosses over uh, the iliac vessels, that's a constriction point, and the urido uh, vesicular junction, that's that little opening into uh, the bladder, yeah. All right, so very important equation here, your filtration fraction, all right? So it, it kind of makes sense, right? How much is filtered? How much goes through the GFR? How much is filtered through the glomerulus over how much total renal plasma flow you have, right? So that's going to give you a percentage of filtra a filtration fraction, the amount filtered over the total amount, okay? So very important to remember that equation. All right. Yeah, so sh this should kind of make sense, right? If you constrict the vessel, your flow is going to decrease, right? If you um, vasodilate the vessel, the flow is going to increase. It gets a little bit more complicated. And here we go, right? So <clears throat> let me see, maybe it's easier if I annotate this. All right, now let's say blood's flowing. Okay, so this is our glomerulus. I don't like the, how this is organized, but you know, let's, let's put the glomerulus like this, right? This is kind of how it is, right? We're, we're joining these two pictures here. All right, so let's say blood's coming in here to the afferent arteriole right? And we constrict this, right? Then that means we're going to get less blood all the way across, right? That means there's also going to be less blood because there's two ways. It can go afferent to efferent 
but some of it needs to go afferent down here to be filtered. I think 10% is filtered every time your blood passes through. Um, don't quote me on that though, right? So you need a certain percentage to go, 20%, thank you. Um, so you need a certain percentage to go through the glomerulus. So if you constrict the afferent arterial, you're decreasing your GFR simply because you're decreasing the amount of blood that's going through this system altogether. So you're decreasing the amount that's gonna get to the, uh, the, the glomerulus. So you're decreasing your GFR, okay? Now, what happens if we constrict the efferent arterial instead, right? So let's constrict over here. Now, same amount of blood is going through here, but now the path of least resistance is going to be this way, right? Because we constricted this, right? So some blood's gonna go through the efferent, but ideally by constricting our afferent arterial, we are actually gonna increase the amount of blood that's going to the glomerulus, all right? So by doing this, by constricting the afferent uh, um, arterial, we're increasing our GFR. So very important difference here. And certain things like prostaglandins, angiotensin II, work on different areas, y'all will get into that later. But the point is you can modulate your GFR just by where you constrict, right? One versus the other. So I think that's kind of interesting. And yeah, that's what we talked about there. This is it in a diagram format. Easy test question to lay out here. Um, everybody loves the arrows, I can't stand them, right? Yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, Everybody hates them, uh, all the different arrows up and down. Um, my advice when you do those though, just on a different note is like, like if I do them, I cross them out on exam soft as I go, just because uh, it makes it easier for me to, uh, to do it. I know that seems like a simple suggestion, but I think there is a psychological component to actually crossing stuff off. But anyway, but yeah, so this does matter. Uh, and by, by increasing your uh, GFR, that's the numerator in this equation, this filtration fraction. So by increasing your GFR, you're obviously increasing your filtration fraction. All right, let's go into the tubules. So four definitions you need to know. Filtration is gonna come through the glomerulus, how much is actually filtered. Reabsorption or resorption sometimes um, called is what actually is going from the tubular or the urinary fluid back to the vessel. All right, secretion is what didn't get filtered originally and is now going to get into the tubular fluid from the vessel, from that vasorecta, right, that comes down. And then excretion is going to be what you get rid of. So this equation basically tells you everything that got into the urinary system minus the stuff you reabsorbed, right? Everything you filtered, everything you secreted, uh, uh, is going to be excreted minus that little bit you reabsorb. So however you need to think about it, um, this is a good equation to remember. Um, and it just kind of ends up telling you how much um, overall is going to be excreted. Now, what's important about this is certain, um, certain molecules have different characteristics, right? So some things such as inulin and mannitol are freely filtered, right? Small, they're small little uh, ions or small little particles everything's filtered, right? So that being said, everything goes through, nothing's reabsorbed, nothing needs to be secreted because all of it gets filtered. In an ideal situation, um, this is a great measurement of GFR, but it's not as easily measured as creatinine, which is what they use, um, but creatinine is a good estimate of your GFR. So that's actually what they use to, to measure your GFR, your creatinine. Um, because it's, it's a standardized way of measuring something and saying, how much are you filtering? Because whereas inulin and mannitol are freely filtered, uh, um, creatinine is filtered and uh, secreted. Um, so it's still, the point, the point being when you do this uh, is that by, by finding a molecule that is very easily measured, like should be a cons consistent for everyone with normal kidney function, you can, you can measure it on a consistent basis, right? Okay, so these are the things that are net reabsorbed, glucose, sodium, urea. Now, um, it's very important that glucose, especially in the proximal convoluted tube, you don't wanna be peeing out sugar, right? You wanna hold on to all your glucose. That, that is your, uh, your source of um, 
of energy, right? And then sodium as well, but you actually are going to use sodium later on after it's reabsorbed um, to, uh, for your gradient. Um, yeah, so it is kind of tricky. It's like, why would, why would urea be absorbed? But they actually use, uh, urea is actually used in, uh, in the countercurrent exchanger system. So eventually down the line on the tubule, you're gonna get rid of urea. You use it as an ionic component in the beginning uh, just to help get that water gradient going. Um, but that's a little, I mean, I, I think they mentioned that in a few slides for you guys. Um, and then here you go. So the net secretion here, and this is where you see creatinine. Uh, for those of you that work out, creatine, uh, I know it's creatine supplements. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically creatinine is creatine that's broken down um, into your system that you end up uh, getting um, uh, in your urine. So it's the same thing. It's just a breakdown product of it. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe this equation. Yeah, just your net transport rate. I think, that, did y'all have Dr. Chilapilla do this? Didn't she teach all this? I think she taught us this. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, it gets a little tricky, but um, as long as you know the equation, you should be good to go. I don't think uh, it was made as complicated. I don't think she, she made it as complicated on the exam as the topic is in lecture. So um, anyway, I put a star in this slide. These are good equations to know, right? Of course, your filtration fraction and your uh, GFR over renal plasma flow for sure. All right, then you can determine your hematocrit, which is basically, uh, well, this is the estimate of your renal blood flow by using your hematocrit, which is the amount of red blood cells you have. Um, but um, yeah, I think I just wanted this on here for completeness sake, just in case, but I don't know that they'd, they'd go as far as to ask you that. All right, so you've learned by now there's different mechanisms, facilitated diffusion, like your glute transporter, simple diffusion, uh, as you know, it's just a simple, simple, um, channel or whatnot, and then active transport like the SGLT pathways. So I don't want you to get too bogged down with this. Um, there's a lot of different channels going on, but as long as you get the general understanding of what happens at each different place, you should be fine. So um, when, oh, so well, before we get into the different segments, um, y'all know this by now, primary versus secondary uh, transport, um, so we don't need to get into that, but when we get into the tubule system. So goal number one, once we get af after anything is filtered, all right, ideally you're not filtering too much glucose and stuff into your urine, right? Um, because you want to reabsorb as much as possible. Any amino acids, any glucose, anything you really wanna hold on to, right? You wanna get it back in the proximal tubule. It's kind of like your first priority, get everything back. So that's the idea there. You get these channels, uh, glucose, um, you get stuff back, you use sodium to do it, you pull back your protein and stuff like that. So the problem is with people with diabetes, their, their sugars, their levels are so high in the 400s, 500 range is that it overwhelms the system. So you end up peeing out sugar, right? Glucose and uh, glucosuria. And that's just because it's overwhelming the kidneys. Amino acids, if there's a problem with the, with the tubule, uh, people with chronic kidney failure, uh, a lot of times you'll see proteinuria, right? Uh, proteins in the urine. But the main point of the proximal convoluted tubule is that you're gonna reabsorb these things, right? All right, so diuretics, basically, remember we talked about aldosterone and the idea is that if you're able to, aldosterone is, works the channel to where you end up bringing sodium and water back into the body. By bringing sodium back, you bring water back. So you're increasing your volume, you're increasing your blood pressure. Diuretics work the opposite way. Um, some of the, a lot of them like to use sodium just because it's an easy way. So if you could block certain, like the aldosterone receptor, uh, if you could block that, then you, obviously you'll pee out sodium, but you'll also pee out a lot of water. So the idea of diuretics is that if you can urinate more water out, you can decrease your blood pressure. Uh, you could put less workload on the heart. Y'all don't need to get into too much detail with this because um, it's definitely a term for issue. All right, loop of Henley. Now we're starting to get into the water versus sodium battle, right? So you could see here, um, um, 
that we have certain channels, this, uh, in, what is it called? The NCCK channel, yeah. And that's the main one that like, um, that loop diuretics work on, this channel. So, um, and, and, and that allows water to stay in the tubular fluid. But the point is uh, you're able to uh, bring sodium uh, back through this channel. You bring chloride back as well. Uh, it is important to note that calcium and magnesium do follow, but it is um, uh, paracellular, right? So mm -hmm. it's a paracellular process that you see here. So it uses a, 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 the gradient that you form here, this transcellular process, and they come across too. So just an extra note, just in case they ask. Once you get down to the distal convoluted tubule, that's where our friend PTH works, right? And it, remember PTH is gonna work primarily on calcium. It will reabsorb calcium while getting rid of phosphates. And um, beyond that, you really don't need to dive too much into like what's going on. The whole process is um, get back what you need. And then how do we regulate two major, <laughs> two major things, sodium and water? Well, you kind of have to do them independently. So you make one part uh, impermeable to sodium, you deal with the water, then you make the next part impermeable to uh, water and you deal with the sodium. You go through the process and by the end, hopefully everything's ironed out. Now at the end in the collecting tubule, if everything isn't worked out, you still have extra water channels there, okay? So if you're at some sort of deficit or you're, you're very hypervolemic or whatever, um, those water channels with ADH can also be used just to bring back pure water. Okay, so it's it's a very um, it's a fine tuned system. I think the kidneys. I could definitely attest that the kidneys are are very underrated as a uh, as an important <laughs> organ for sure. Um, all right, and then this kind of we talked about this. This is the process: increase renin, increase angiotensin, um, and you're also going to increase aldosterone. Therefore, you are bringing fluid back. Okay, so very uh, important process. Remember that the the key thing the macula dense is going to work on, or the JGA cells, is that volume. If you have decreased GFR, it kind of tells you you're hypovolemic, right? Because you're not getting proper blood flow. Yeah. Um, yeah, the aquaporins are in the collecting tubule. Yeah, I don't think they call. I think it's just the collecting tube. Like, I don't know that they really consider it the descending part. It's just, yeah, it's all in the collecting tube. Yeah. Um, and then the late distal tubule, there is one here. Yeah, the principal cells. So these are weird. They have aldosterone receptors and ADH. Um, this is like that last section before the collecting tubules, but primarily the ADH receptors are gonna be a little bit lower down, um, the V2 receptors, but you do have some on these principal cells. Mm -hmm. um, so it can regulate aldosterone will help to bring back the sodium, get rid of potassium with sodium goes water. ADH is just gonna be pure water, okay? So uh, when you talk about, I think, did y'all talk about SIADH? Do we need to, we'll probably get to it if y'all did talk about it. Yeah, okay, then it'll come up. All right. And then once you get down here, we're still in the distal uh, tubule, we have aldosterone. And uh, one of the tricky things is wh why, why would uh, excess aldosterone cause metabolic acidosis? So let's walk through this, I'm um, sorry, metabolic alkalosis, because this is that para pa paradoxical aciduria, I think it's called. Um, so what happens here? Okay, so if you have excess aldosterone, you're going to, um, you're going to uh, bring back sodium. So you're going to kick out potassium into the urine. So when we get lower down, if, if it's excess, if there's excess aldosterone, then you're going to be bringing in excess sodium. Therefore, you're going to be kicking out excess potassium. If you kick out excess potassium, your body's going to become hypokalemic because you're peeing it all out. Now, the process lower down in the collecting tubule, if, if, you're, if you're in a process where you're peeing out a lot of potassium, there are channels that can actually try to take back some potassium, but in that process, you have to get rid of hydrogens. There are hydrogen potassium pump, okay? So if you excess aldosterone, you're peeing out a lot of potassium. So lower down in the tubule, the tubule's like, we need to bring back potassium. Therefore you have to kick out uh, hydrogens. And by doing that, uh, you get metabolic acidosis, okay? So adenosine as a vasoconstrictor, I'm not exactly sure how it is, I just know it is. Um, 
I just think that's one of the characteristics of it. Um, I don't think you need to go into too much detail on that. Um, and then this just kind of uh, goes into, um, I don't know where I got that. I guess I got this from your lectures. Yeah, where they work and stuff. Don't do too much of this. This is definitely a term for a problem for sure. All right, regulating body fluids. So this is probably the most important part. Remember two thirds of your blood, body fluid is gonna be in your ICF. <clears throat> One third will be in your ECF. Of that, three fourths is interstitial, one fourth is plasma. All right, you could do a, work out a lot of math by just knowing this right here. All right, and then you kind of distribute it. I didn't think we'd have to know this, but it did come up. Like uh, guys have, is it 60%? Yeah, 60%. Females is like 50 to 55, right? So we had to do a math problem. Um, in regards to that, and they didn't give us these values. So just definitely know those off the top of your head, for sure. Um, and then again, there's that blood volume equation over hematocrit, plasma volume over one minus hematocrit. It's basically taking the red blood cells out and uh, telling you what your plasma volume is. Now I put a star on this slide just because they can give you some math problems um, that correlate to this. Um, so they, what they can do is they can give you any of these. So first off, you need to know what these correlate to, okay? So they'll give you inulin, for instance, mm -hmm. and you'll know inulin correlates to your ECF. And they'll ask you something like, what's the ICF? So they'll give you, uh, they'll give you the levels with uh, you know, titrated water and, and inulin, okay? And then they'll ask you what the ICF is. So you have to know that titrated water correlates to total body water. That means it goes through everything, right? It, it, there's no restrictions. Inulin is restricted to your ECF. It doesn't get in the cells. So by knowing that, you can figure out your ICF, okay? So just knowing where these falls, the math ends up being fairly easy. It's just remembering what goes with what. Um, why not put that on here? I don't know, probably just this, just this equation here. Um, B equals Q over C, I don't know. Uh, we, it seems like we did this like 10 years ago, but um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I've aged, I feel like. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, it's sure. So yeah, this is, uh, this is more like if you were to inject it, right? So not just taking your body fluids, um, but injecting it, right? So compartment volume, yeah. All right, so this, um, I think I put, yes, okay. Don't let this confuse you. So the way I like to think of it, now your osmolarity is on your y-axis, okay? So that's gonna tell you how much stuff is in the water, right? How many particles, right? Your water is going to be in your, x-axis, okay? So if we look at it here, we could see the amount of solutes or the amount of stuff in your fluid is going to correlate to our y and the amount of water is going to correlate to our x. Now if we look at that here, so for instance with, with diarrhea you tend to lose a lot of free water. Now how if you just looked at this graph and you were like what's going on, if you remember that um, the x-axis correlates to water. You could say that there was a lot of free water lost, right? A little bit of ions, you do tend to lose bicarb, but it tends overall to be a lot of free water loss because usually it's an enteric problem. So a lot of water gets into, uh, free water gets into your GI tract. Now, what if we talk about water deprivation? Now, in this situation, you are contracting both your ICF and your ECF, but um, it's, a, it's a free water deprivation, right? Like you don't drink saline, you drink pure water. So what ends up happening is you get uh, excess, uh, your osmolarity goes up just because you're decreasing the amount of free water. So the ratio of, um, of solutes or particles in your fluid um, uh, increases. So you get increased uh, osmolarity and you get a shrinking of the amount of, of water. Um, how come diarrhea losing water doesn't make the ICF hyperosmotic? 
Um, yeah, I think it's just a transient process. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you uh, off the top of my head um, definitively, uh, but I think the idea is that uh, the transient process is that, you know, typically it's some sort of enteric problem. So you tend to lose a lot of I'm water. pretty sure it's because you're losing water from everywhere. Yeah. Maybe. Because when you're, yeah. I think you're losing water from everywhere. So that's why I think it's isoosmotic. Is isoosmotic. Yeah, I mean, and it's not term. it's not exactly pure water, right? You do lose it a little bit. Like you're not actually holding on to solutes, right? Because um, when you get diarrhea, yeah, there's you also um there's yeah, there's electrolyte loss thing. I was just, yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say that because the big thing is you want to make sure that your electrolytes are also good too, because if you go like severely hypokalemic, which is a risk when you have like really, really bad diarrhea, um, that's more usually in like a severe pathological disease state, but you're losing a lot of electrolytes as well. So I think you're just losing everything and not just yeah. water. So that's why you have the isoosmotic volume contraction. And and the way you could tell that is look at the difference between pure water deprivation versus diarrhea. Like you get this higher concentration just because the osmolarity goes up. The amount of particles doesn't necessarily go up, but because you decrease the amount of free water you have with those particles, technically the osmolarity goes up, right? So even though it looks here like it is pure water right here, you are losing a good bit, but overall you're losing more water than you are solutes, right? Okay. Um, honestly, uh, the, uh, the way this was taught, uh, I think, uh, I'm going to ex just explain it to you like the way I'd like down and dirty, the way I do it for the exam, because you really could dive into a lot of these different things. Like why is the ICF more than the ECF? The way I, uh, rationalize a lot of it is that most of the time the compartments don't change too much. It lands around. So as for testing purposes, y'all will probably have one or two questions on this. And it's going to be like straight up, like if there's water deprivation, you would expect this graph. Like, but going beyond that um, is really be beyond the scope of um, beyond the scope of my knowledge and beyond the scope of the, the class. For yeah, sure. just be able to associate the pathology with the graph um, and with the term too, not just the graph, but the term. Um, and that should be probably be enough. I know with us, they loved SIADH. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure good, like yeah. hemorrhage or diarrhea or dehydration, that was a big one too. So those big ones that are associated with disease states, um, that's probably what they're going to focus on. So the adrenal insufficiencies, the SIADH, the diarrhea, the dehydration, yeah. that kind of and thing. It's not that it's terribly complicated to actually work this out in your head. It's just very time consuming to like try to figure out the compartments and like what it, what ions are you actually losing. I promise you, you don't need to know it that in that much detail. Just down and dirty is good at this point. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about syndrome of inappropriate ADH. What does ADH do? It brings back pure water, right? So it's anti-diuretic hormone. It prevents you from diuresis. Right? So it's going to bring back free water. So if we have this, what's this chart going to look like? Uh, obviously, since our x-axis is water, you're going to expand your water compartment. Now, did you technically get rid, did your osmolarity, did you get more solutes in this process? No, not really, but you diluted them down a little bit, right? Because of the increased water. And that's why this has dropped a little bit. So by bringing in pure water, your osmolarity will go down a little bit just because of that dilution factor. But I don't, don't spend too much time on these. Like literally just make sure you can look at the graph and be like, yo, that's that. Like you should be good to go. Um, uh, so y'all really don't need to get into this. Uh, I think the main thing is just knowing that you know, 0.9% saline, that's isotonic, that's uh, the salt in your system, 0.5 is half, right? So that's basically all you need to know. I think they gave us a question with dextrose, but like they, they, they said there was a dextrose, um, yeah, that would be hypertonic. Yeah, if you have a 5% dextrose in 0.9, anything in addition to the 0.9, because uh, this is isotonic. So anything you put in there would be hypertonic, anything beyond that, yeah. Um, we did have a question on our exam, I believe it was, it had dextrose, but they said it was a dextrose solution and they told us it was isotonic. 
okay? So you were able to easily work out like big volume expansion through that. Um, and then this is kind of just everything in a nutshell right here for you guys. All right, serum proteins. Um, don't sleep on this because these could be easy points for you for sure. Um, just kind of knowing where everything fits in. So um, albumin's our big peak, right? So we, we talk about this. Um, I think Dr. Trotz did this, if I remember correctly. So albumin is our big peak. And then we have some that fall into these peaks. So if you remember these, um, you can kind of see where they fit. That gamma peak is always going to be your immunoglobulins. So um, they, yeah, so, okay. So let's talk about hypoalbuminemia. What is the main thing we talked about albumin with? Albumin stays in the vessel, so it keeps that oncotic pressure high. It's that pulling pressure. It keeps things in the vessels. So your first thought if someone has, uh, if they have nephrotic syndrome, so they're peeing out a lot of protein, if they have um, a, a, like quashiorcore, core, a deficiency of uh, dietary proteins, or if they have liver failure where they're not even making uh, uh, albumin, what you're gonna see is that decrease in oncotic pressure is gonna push all the fluid out. That hydrostatic pressure is gonna overwhelm it because you have nothing holding it in the vessels. So that's what you're gonna see. <clears throat> and severe burns fall into that category as well. So that's what you would expect, just a lot of edema, right? In the interstitial fluid, edema and ascites. Ascites is that swollen stomach like that. All right, and we talked about alpha-1 antitrypsin. It is an antiprotease, right? So let's use smoking for an example. If you smoke a lot, uh, you're gonna get neutrophils, increased neutrophils. Neutrophils uh, uh, have elastase, which is a protease, right? It's elastase. So if you have increased elastase, um, you're gonna break down a lot of the architecture in the lungs. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin is supposed to uh, block these, uh, this elastase or these proteases, but if you don't have it, then uh, you're going to get an accelerated rate of breakdown with the elastase. So keep that in mind. Don't forget it also has a component, um, a, a liver component too. So they have liver failure. All right. And then I don't know what this is. It's a serine protease inhibitor. Yeah. So that's how it works. Um, yeah. Maybe that this must have been from Dr. Sobring. So, yeah. That gene. And yeah, like I said, it does involve um, hepatocellular injury as well. Smoking, yeah, we talked about this. It, obviously, if you have alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, it'll make this emphysema happen uh, much sooner. And this is a good point. Like, look at the different uh, the mechanisms. So a good teaching point here, it has these different things. From, if you remember from way back what allelic heterogeneity is, right, different. Uh, on the same uh, gene, different mutations on the same gene, loss of function in the lungs because you lost the antiprotease, but it is also an attainment of a novel function in the liver. Um, oh yeah, and that's that novel function is what causes hepatocyte damage. So that's a good test question for you guys. The pathology, the protection from elastase, but also the hepatocyte damage as well. So keep that in mind. Alpha V, and the reason we're going through these is because these all fall under, uh, under this, right? Under these different plasma proteins. So we're just talking about them briefly, just in case they come up. Alpha feta protein's another one, um, and you can see that here. Uh, it uh, tends to happen. It tends to be elevated in hepatocellular carcinoma. I don't know if they'd ask y'all that, but um, you can actually use it to check for neural tube defects as well. Um, alpha beta protein is elevated in neural tube. It tends to be decreased, I believe, in Down syndrome as well. Uh, yes, here. Okay. Um, Wilson's disease, remember that that's copper. Uh, cobalamin, I believe it's called. Is it cobalamin? Where does it say it? Yeah, it's called cobalamin, right? Uh, that's what. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, that's what that's the 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 storage or carrying uh, form of copper. So if you don't have cobalamin, uh, you can end the, or you don't have this ability to transfer uh, the copper to the the transport protein to make cobalamin. Uh, you can get Wilson's disease. This copper transporting ATPase is the problem. 
Uh, and what they like to talk about is this Claire Fischer rings, right? They're a copper ring. Seroplasmin, that's it. Thank you. Kishore, where are you at? Come say hi. Kishore showed up just to say hi. That's our buddy. Uh, he just finished term two, so. <laughs> All right, saving the day, Keish. Thanks, buddy. All right. So uh, those are those are actually copper ring, copper deposits that form around the around the eyes, but of course it could form in the liver and the uh, CMS as well. And then, like I said, these immunoglobulins, right? It's a complex of all of them, IgGs, IgMs, all of the antibodies you make. But what you can actually see, especially in multiple myeloma, which is cancer, uh, you get this monoclonal spike. Monoclonal meaning one antibody. Usually it's IgG. So you get this huge mono, monoclonal spike and um, it's this gamma spike. So if you ever see this, uh, it's typically multiple myeloma. They like to test on this because it's a, it's a monoclonal gammaopathy, gammaopathy, right? What's up, Kishore? <laughs> Kishore lets us use his account to do these. So y'all make sure y'all thank Kishore. All right, so monoclonal. All right, and then when you are sick, some of these are altered, right? So you have some that are positive acute phase reactants, so they're elevated, whereas some are negative. So things such as albumin are, de are uh, the decreased synthesis of albumin and stuff so that you can up upregulate or synthesize more of these, so. Just good to know some memorization there, but um, yeah. C-reactive protein is another one that is an acute phase reactant, but it doesn't fall under this curve. So this is the main one you could test for if there is some sort of um, infection that should be elevated. All right, super important slide. I think if you know these, you can answer any of these questions to be, to be honest. Uh, anytime you have decreased um, albumin, like here, if you have acute, acute inflammation, I remember albumin is a negative uh, acute phase reactant. So you're gonna decrease it so that you can have uh, this spike here. Liver problems, decreased albumin. We said multiple myeloma has that monoclonal gamma spike. Nephrotic syndrome, you're actually getting rid of albumin here, no gamma globulins, no alpha-1 antitrypsin. So that would fall there. But if you can point these out, you should be good to go. All right, and this is more of review when we talk about uh, block body fluid and sodium and, uh, and water, right? So it's all about um, regulating it. So whether it primarily the RAS system or the nerves that control your, um, your uh, vasoconstriction, vasodilation, afferent, efferent, Starling's forces such as the hydrostatic pressure and atrial natriuretic peptide as well comes into play. Right, so that'll sense hypertension, whereas the RAS system is going to be hypotension. Now, the baroreceptors, baro meaning pressure, these pressure receptors are going to help to regulate or monitor um, your blood pressure. If need be, they will signal uh, to the JGA cells, along with uh, the macula densa, which is going to sense your sodium, uh, decrease in GFR via sodium, and it's going to tell uh, the JGA cells to release renin. And we talked about that, right? So renin's released, you end up getting angiotensin two, it tenses down on the vessels. Also aldosterone is gonna reabsorb sodium. So it's a twofold way to increase your blood volume and blood pressure, right? Squeezing down on the vessels, plus you bring in sodium and water back in. Good system. All right, and you can see that here. Yeah, all right. Uh, and we talked about that again, all right? From first aid, if you want a little bit more. Um, baroreceptor reflex, again, uh, <clears throat> it does sense a decrease in blood pressure, which is weird. Once you get a decrease in blood pressure, it actually causes a decrease in firing. Y'all will get to that a little bit later, but that decreased baroreceptor firing, it's like inverse of what you would think, will cause increased sympathetic tone, cause the vasculature to uh, tense down, right? And then it will decrease renal sodium excretion kind of like uh, aldosterone does. All right, and then again, this is what we're talking about, this hydrostatic pressure versus oncotic pressure. But Starling's forces basically are just gonna be your pressure gradients, right? Again, this is that equation, I'm sure it's gonna come up, but don't freak out if they don't give you the constants. If they don't give you the constants, just accept them as one, right? 
like I said, that you could write this equation many different ways. This is the way I like to do it with all the negatives, keep the hydrostatics together, keep the oncotics together. So um, I just like this picture. It kind of just puts everything together. So not that y'all have time to sit here and stare at this uh, before your exam Monday, but um, it kind of just outlines everything very nicely. And we've talked about the heart, but A and P atrial natriuretic peptide will sense hypertension, right? So it'll help to get rid of sodium, thus water, right? And then again, this goes into first aid, kind of just points out a little bit of what's going on. And you can see that ADH primarily is down in the collecting tube down here. Um, yeah. All right, and then, like I said, don't get too bogged down with this. Just understand the ideas that one part, this first part is impermeable to sodium or ion so that fluid can go. Um, and then the next part is impermeable to water so that uh, salt can go. And through this process, you end up diluting the fluid down um, to what you want it to be, okay? So you don't need to do it, no math involved here. Don't stress that. And this is what we were saying earlier. This is why urea is reabsorbed originally so that it could actually be used in this countercurrent uh, exchange system. All right, so this is really important. So diabetes insipidus, diabetes meaning loving, or sorry, uh, yeah, water loving, right? So like diabetes mellitus is sugar loving, diabetes insipidus is water loving, right? So the idea is that you're constantly drinking water. Why is that? That is because you're constantly peeing water, right? And the problem here is the ADH. So central DI is, a, you don't have ADH production in the, um, in the pituitary, right? And nephrogenic DI means these uh, receptors, these receptors in the kidney don't work. Now, the problem is when this patient comes in, they're gonna present the same. They're gonna be like, doc, I drink a lot, I pee all the time, I'm always thirsty, what do I do? Now you need to determine whether it's nephrogenic or central. So how do you do that? What you actually do is you give them ADH, right? Right here. And you could see now, if the receptors are messed up, if it's nephrogenic, then it doesn't matter if you give them ADH. Like it's not gonna improve anything, right? The receptors don't work. But if they're not synthesizing, if it's central DI, uh, once you give them ADH, they should respond to it, right? So the urine osmolarity will go up, meaning they're holding on to water, right? They're not peeing it all out, okay? So make sure you know this, they're definitely gonna ask about this. It's just a good way to uh, kind of integrate clinical medicine with, um, with what you're learning right now. All right. And this is a good slide. Uh, I'm pretty sure they gave us some, for some reason I have like um, PTSD from these um, arrow slides, from these arrow uh, questions on the exam when I'm like upside down looking at them. Um, but yeah, so make sure you can differentiate what's going on with this. Again, remember osmolarity means increased solutes, right? So increased osmolarity means you're holding on to solutes. Decrease osmolarity means it's very, um, it's very dilute, right? Stop laughing at me, Lindsay. All right, again, summaries, summary, summaries, right? So anything that's positive is hypoosmotic, negative is hyperosmotic urine, all right? This is in relation to urine. So these are just more, again, the, any formulas they're gonna give you guys um, or any equations are gonna be straightforward since y'all don't have uh, scratch paper. All right, so this looks freaky, but it's not as bad as you think. All right, so what you need to do here is that anything above uh, the, the midline, right, is going to be into the urine. Anything below it is going to be stuff you keep. As you move along the x-axis is what you get rid of or what you end up keeping, what you get out of this, the fluid, right? So what did we say? This is on the keep side. We said immediately our first goal is to bring back glucose, proteins, amino acids as soon as possible, right? So let we get those out the way. Now, what did we also say? That inulin, creatinine, they're pretty much um, freely filtered, right? We don't bring it back. So you can see those up in this graph over here, right? Because you're gonna get rid of most of them. As for sodium and, and potassium, it kind of fluctuates depending on where you go. But the point is uh, you can kind of see how you go down the nephron, what you end up keeping and what you end up uh, peeing out. So it's just a good way of doing it. Um, 
This is another way of looking at it, but this is just the proximal tubule. But what they could do and what I do believe they asked us is they actually just didn't, they gave us the lines and didn't tell us what it is, right? So unfortunately you just, you kind of need to know what goes where. I would say no both of them, you know, at least the main stuff, like definitely glucose amino acids coming back. Creatinine is important because they use it clinically, um, stuff like that. Um, I think, honestly, I think what they actually asked us though was, was bicarb. For some reason, I remember it being this. Um, so know that too, bicarb's a very important one. Just be able to point all these out on, um, on the graph, yeah. So same thing, this is just the proximal convoluted tubule, but um, this one's more important because it, it goes through the whole thing, the whole nephron. All right, um, so we talked about this already. What's excreted is everything minus what you brought back in, okay? More formulas, again, they should be first order type questions, these formulas, so don't freak out. All right, I think this is the last stuff. Acid but you will have a fair amount of questions. I need, stuff, to, so. I need to mango. I need to mango monster. I, I'm gonna be this mango. Spoke, spokesperson. Mango monster. That's it's so good. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm addicted to it. Um, <laughs> but I need to I need to mango monster before we do acid bases. So y'all just to get them like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah go for it. It's, it's a fun question. It's not the, from here. I have to do completion for FTM one and two. <laughs> so um, yeah. I want to know why. Um, sorry, wait, I have to find it. Okay. This is the question. Um, a five years old boy taken to emergency room because his, uh, uh, his mother said who reported that uh, this child eaten some berry in the garden and it was tachycardia, uh, heart rate 120 and had raised the body temperature to 101. His people were grossly dilated. And uh, the most appropriate antidote uh, for this patient. The answer is uh, pheostigmine, but why not atropine? Um, so, because you are talking about an insecticide. And so yeah. neostigmine is the drug of choice to counteract the, um, yeah, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, so I remember, Physostigmine sounds like fixes. So Pfizer yeah. fixes, okay. so it, it okay. fixes it. Yeah, it's a tricky question. I, I, they usually involve a farmer when they talk about that, um, mm -hmm. being able, you know, in a field. Yeah, um, but yeah, you wanna fix it with, um, with Physostigmine. So when yeah, yeah the, key there, the key there was that he was in the yard and he ate a berry from the yard. Yes, and so, and so when do we use atropine? that should trigger it's a um that's an insecticide. No, yes, atropine, but they told us yes, sorry. Yeah, atropine is a muscarinic uh, antagonist, so you can use it in certain situations, um, but they typically save that for like when people are in uh, show up to the ED and they're like in cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. and you give them atropine, but it is a reversal agent. Yeah. Okay, okay, because I remember in some of the slides for the uh, again, uh, pesticides, uh, they suggest atropine as well in our lecture. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was confused. Why not atropine? You know, now uh, that you say um, that, I, there's it, two. I think yeah. there's two. So, and it's like time um, frame also dependent on it too. So like you, like atropine, you can administer like up to a certain point and then after that like like then you apply like i think physiostigmine or one of those um in order to counteract it long term it's a very specific i okay. think don't tend to go that deep on it no, so if you if straight. you go with if you go with atropine trust me <clears throat> it's gonna be likely the answer okay, okay. this is why um cholinergic that's still an anti-cholinergic um it's still a tertiary, I mean. Is that because you said an uh, antidote? So it's an antidote to organophosphates. 
And so okay. again, the key is that he was in like a garden and ate something from the garden. So you need to figure, you need to think about organophosphates. So okay. the antidote is the physostigmine. Now the atropine, it's still a tertiary amine that is going to, it's an anticholinergic, like it, it's still kind of the same thing, but atropine is going to be more of, um, it's not reversible. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes while I'm talking. The point is that the point is that um, organophosphates specifically work on acetylcholinesterase. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. even though even though you're technically it is a muscarinic, like it's more of a direct approach to fixing the problem. Like okay. you're you're directly counteracting the organophosphate, which is inhibiting the acetylcholinesterase. Right. Okay. So okay. that's so the, the answer... idea there. Yeah. Okay, so. so... Sorry. Yeah, so that's why, because uh, with these organophosphate poisonings, physostigmine can directly uh, act on the acetylcholinesterase. Okay, it's an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Perfect. So when they both present, I will prefer the physostigmine. If they're not, then I'll choose atropine. Well, if they're talking uh, look about- Look at the history. Look yeah, at the history. Okay. And if so a look farmer- you're out in the, I'm sorry, we start talking at the exact no same worries. time. It's, fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's the patient history. That's what it is. And so they're working out in the farm, they're working out in the yard. And so you want that to think organophosphate. So exactly what Brady just said, it's the anticholinesterase thing. And so that's when you're thinking physostigmine. Now, something else, if they come in and they don't give that history of being in the farm, being in the field, then you can go more towards atropine because that is... Um, it's more for muscarinics, not yeah. exactly the acetylcholinesterase. Yeah. Okay. But we should, okay. yeah, if you have any more questions, you could just message us. We should we should carry on. Um, perfect. No, this waiting. is perfect. Thank you so no much. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so now that y'all have been here about five hours, we're going to do the most important thing. I swear our test had like 20 questions on this stuff. So I'm not going to rush through it. We'll take our time and we'll get through it. But I, I'm serious. Like there was probably 20 questions that were just straight up. If you could do this, you're good I to go. Test. Yeah. So I, I'm but, but it does get easy once you get it down. So yeah, if sure. you spend a lot of time on it and you get down essentially the formula, you can do them. So, so it's gonna, it's, I know it's intimidating. I know it's a lot, but it, if you get the formula down and you practice it, it, you start to realize that it really is just kind of a, you know, a stepwise, okay, if this is true, then this, if this is true, then this. So just make sure you get that formula down, make sure you get to know the idea, and then you should be good on all those 20, 30 questions, whatever it is. Yeah, Lucas, that's right. Actually, uh, you don't need to get into that now. That's actually a big point uh, that they talk about in term four because those thiazides are very important for hypercalcemia, but you don't need to worry about, right, about it right now. It's just the different transporters that they use. The, the thiazides don't actually work on the, the, the calcium transporters. So they end up, it ends up staying in. Yeah, but you don't need to worry about that right now. All right, <clears throat> so I'm very methodical when I do these. Um, and by doing that, uh, you pretty much... Um, keep the stress low and it kind of standardizes everything. So um, it's a lot of words, but we'll kind of talk about it as we go. All right, yeah, acids versus bases, which I'll understand that at this point, buffers are gonna kind of hold us at a normal pH. We know that the main major body buffer is bicarbonate. All right, so 20 to one, yeah, okay. But this is very much, um, these aren't going to be like the questions y'all had. This is more review from FDM1. Y'all remember the henderson hasselbeck equation. Um, if they do come up with this, I know. So um, the way I, wait, y'all did do, yeah, y'all do this in FDM1, right? This is review. Okay, good. Because the questions they're going to ask on your exam now are much more like clinically relevant now. But just remember wherever it should be absorbed. So like if it's an acid in the stomach, you would expect it to be in this range, right? Because acids are absorbed in the stomach. If it's a base and it's in the intestine, you would expect it to be in this range. So don't get confused on the, the different logs, right? Um, whichever side it is. Remember one correlates to one nine, two is two nine, three is three nine. It's just a quick trick. All right. Now, excretion for drugs. 
is the exact opposite of absorption. You want the drug to be lipophilic, so it crosses the phospholipid bilayer, crosses the membrane, gets into, circula gets into circulation or gets into the body. When you want to excrete it, you want to ionize it, right? So you're gonna pass back through the liver, you're gonna metabolize it, and you're gonna make it into an ion form. So this is, allows it to be uh, excreted, primarily you urinate it out. So you need that drug to be very ionized, not lipophilic, but ionized so that you could get it into the urine. Okay, um, more bicarbonate. Yeah, but y'all know this now. All right, so the first thing you need to remember specifically when you talk about the respiratory uh, problems um, is that you treat carbon dioxide as an acid, okay? Now, what that means is if you're hypoventilating, you're holding on to carbon dioxide, so you're gonna be in respiratory acidosis. If you're hyperventilating, you're getting rid of carbon dioxide, which we're treating as an acid, so you're gonna be in respiratory alkalosis, okay? So that's the first step, that's what I use. And remember, the respiratory compensation process is much faster, whereas you could do it second by second, whereas the kidneys take a few days, right? Okay, so respiratory acid-based problems. Primarily, we're talking about anything that's gonna cause you to hold on to carbon dioxide, <clears throat> which means you're hypoventilating. Uh, most of the time, they talk about this in regards to um, opioid overdose. That'll cause you uh, respiratory depression, okay? So CO2 acts as an acid. Um, <clears throat> and then of course the kidneys is gonna regulate your bicarbonate. So by doing that, you can, you can modulate your, uh, your acid base levels. But again, that takes a little bit more time. So uh, what you can actually do is if you're in a state of metabolic acidosis is you're gonna want to pee out more acids, right? So you can get rid of them. It's things such as this urinary acid phosphate and ammonium can be excreted to decrease the amount of acid in your system. All right, so very important there because they'll ask you a third order question. You'll realize the patient is in metabolic acidosis. What can you do from a renal standpoint? Pee out the extra acid, right? Try to bring your back down to baseline. All right, so um, yeah, respiratory acidosis, uh, right? We're treating carbon dioxide as an acid. So you're holding on to it. So anytime you have respiratory acidosis, um, you're gonna have to, or you're gonna try to compensate by getting rid of all these extra hydrogens, right? Getting rid of the acid. Okay, hypokalemia. Uh, remember, we talked about this with this per paradoxical uh, aciduria. If we're needing to hold on to potassium, um, you have to excrete more hydrogens, right? So you can um, get the respiratory alkal, I'm sorry, metabolic al alkalosis that way because you're peeing out a lot of hydrogens. Okay, so primary hyperaldosteronism, um, what you're basically doing is you're screening too much aldosterone. So that means you're gonna hold on to sodium, you're gonna hold on to fluid, you're gonna be hypertensive. And in that process, you're gonna be peeing out a lot of potassium. Remember we said the last ditch effort for the body to bring back that potassium is to kick out hydrogen ions and bring back the potassium. So it's gonna to try to do that. It's gonna to try to compensate. It's not gonna do well, but uh, it's gonna bring out some potassium, but you're gonna kick out a lot of hydrogen in the process. So you get into metabolic uh, uh, alkalosis, okay? All right, and then, right. So this is kind of what we were talking about. Hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, okay? Increased potassium, I'm sorry, increase hydrogen secretion. And this is what they call that paradoxic aciduria, right? If you're, if you're in this state, if you're in a metabolic alkalosis state, then why is your urine, right? Why are you peeing out all this acid if you're in an alkalosis state? That's why it's paradoxic because you shouldn't be. But the actual problem is uh, that's causing the metabolic acidosis is the fact that you're having to pee out all that extra hydrogen, okay? <clears throat> we talked about these loops first thiazides. Um, and again, yes, hypercalcemia is a big thing with the thiazides. Right. And then renal compensation, again, it's going to take a little time. But remember, this increased phosphate and ammonium secretion is a good way to get rid of extra acid. All right. 
increase bicarbonate, that's a good way to get rid of ex extra base, right? To get rid of that alkalosis to bring you back down um, uh, to baseline, right? This is from um, first aid. We'll talk about this diagram. Don't let it confuse you. As long as you know the quadrants, just memorize the quadrants and you'll be able to answer the questions on the test. So don't freak out about that. Oh, here it is, right? So you can work it out. Even if you forget, just look at the numbers, right? If you're in uh, a state where you are acidotic, right? Your, your, your pH is down, but you are holding on to, um, you're holding on to bicarb, right? Then you're in a state of respiratory acidosis, right? Um, plasma bicarb. Right, well, yeah. respiratory. So you're, act, and actually, you're actually holding on. Here's the, yeah, here's the line too. You're holding on to carbon dioxide. That's the main thing that's going to keep you in this respiratory acidosis. Anyway, don't get freaked out on the test. Just memorize the different quadrants and know which goes with which. Okay. But um, yeah, use the carbon dioxide and the, um, and the pH for the respiratory problems. You could use the, this y-axis, the bicarb and the pH for the um, for the metabolic or the renal problems. Okay, so don't let that mess you up. All right, and then this kind of breaks it down into the different um, parameters. This is from first aid, right? Uh, understand that the compensatory response is never going to bring you back to proper equilibrium. It's always going to approach it, right? So whenever you find the initial problem. Remember that there's always going to be some sort of effort, if available, to compensate for it. So one of the key things, the last step you have to realize after you determine what the problem is, is are you compensating or not? Okay, so we can get into them now. Remember respiratory acidosis, we're holding on to that acid. We're holding on to carbon dioxide. We're not breathing properly. We're hypoventilating, all right? And then, uh, so if you're chronically hypoventilating, which is, I guess, a weird situation. I don't know. I guess maybe if you're on a ventilator improperly, um, but this chronic process, respiratory acidosis, the kidneys will have time uh, to compensate for it, okay? And then again, like I said, for respiratory acidosis, when you're hypoventilating, typically we talk about um, opioid overdose or, or yeah, opioids. That's usually the example they like to use for that one. Now, acute respiratory alkalosis, that means you're breathing too much, too heavily. Usually they use anxiety for this one as the response. This is why you breathe into a bag if you have an anxiety attack. Uh, it helps you to from preventing this um, respiratory alkalosis problem to breathe back in the carbon dioxide. It helps keep you at, uh, helps keep you at the normalcy, right? Um, so that's usually the example they use there. Chronic respiratory alkalosis. Again, these are very strange because the idea of chronically having a respiratory problem, usually you can compensate for it. So if you have some longstanding lung uh, issue, uh, that could lead to it, uh, maybe even at high altitudes for a while, but you tend to be able to compensate for it with your, with your bicarb. All right, so hyper, uh, hyperventilation, again, anxiety is a big one that they like to talk about and any sort of ventilation if it's not done properly. Oh, and acid as well, yeah. I'm um, sorry, aspirin, sicilic, right? Stimulate the respiratory center. So be careful with that because um, that can actually cause uh, metabolic acidosis as well. So you get respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis with, acid, um, with aspirin, right? Um, because it is an acid that you're taking, but you're, uh, it's gonna cause you to um, have respiratory alkalosis, so be careful with that. Metabolic acidosis, uh, you're either getting rid, rid of bicarb or you're holding on to acid, right? This compensatory process is much faster because you can breathe, uh, uh, you can change your breathing pattern to help compensate for it. All right, and again, if you have metabolic acidosis, even though you tend to quickly compensate with the respiratory system, you can actually compensate with the kidneys as well if it's an ongoing thing, right? So you can also try to get rid of some of those uh, excess um, acids. Diabetic ketoacidosis, y'all are gonna talk about this a lot in uh, DM, but this is um, 
obviously an acidosis that happens in type one diabetics. So um, this is something to look out for. This is a, a common cause of metabolic acidosis. So one of the main things to, to recognize these is if they give you a situation, uh, you determine it's metabolic acidosis and then they'll give you A through E and you know one will be acidos metabolic acidosis, one will be respiratory. So being able to put these in the different categories is gonna be very helpful. Now, anion gaps, um, anything that doesn't classify as uh, uh, cl uh, chloride or, or bicarb is going to is going to count towards your anion gap. Okay, so it's just uh, any sort of increase or decrease, uh, well, increase really of uh, unmeasured anions. Okay, so that can correlate and uh, help to put a flux on your uh, your metabolic uh, acidosis or alkalosis. Make sure you know this equation just to calculate it, just in case they ask. All right, and then here are some causes of metabolic. Acidosis, right? So whether it is uh, increased production or increase uh, of acid or increased loss of base, either way, it's going to cause the same uh, outcome. Again, diabetic ketoacidosis is a big one you want to worry about. They talk about diarrhea a lot too, uh, because that causes a lot of bicarb loss. So that is another one they like to use. Now, metabolic alkalosis means you're holding on to base or you are uh, getting rid of too much acid, right? So remember, again, the compensatory mechanism is to be able to um, breathe, uh, 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 decrease your breathing rate, right? So to hold on to carbon dioxide, to hold on to um, that acid, right? All right. And again, we said this already, right? And these are causes of metabolic alkalosis, nasogastric suction. So they're, they're taking the acid out. Anytime you vomit, vomiting will do it because you're getting rid of uh, that acid in your stomach, right? Mixed disorders, uh, be careful with these if they give you those. Anytime the carbon dioxide and the bicarb go in opposite directions, right? That's gonna be a mixed one. Um, so you could see that there. Uh, like I was saying, as, uh, aspirin is a good one uh, for that. All right, and you could see cesylate or that's aspirin poisoning. Again, so it's gonna cause that uh, that metabolic acidosis, but it's also going to cause respiratory alkalosis. So if they give you one of those, that would be the one that they would give. All right, so that was just kind of introductory into let's, but let's actually look at the, how they're going to present these to you on the exam. All right, so first step: Does the patient have acidosis or alkalosis? That's that's the first thing you need to determine. Next, what is the problem? Is it respiratory or is it metabolic, right? Um, respiratory, yeah, that, I mean, that, that classifies it as mixed. Respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis, yeah. No, the eight, the, you don't have a low bicarb, you have increase, um, you have increased acids, but yeah. Um, so is it, is it respiratory or is it metabolic? And then you check to see whether it's chronic, meaning is there some sort of compensation, okay? All right, and then um, if you look at the Davenport diagram, again, you could just uh, memorize the different quadrants and you'll be able to do that on the exam. This is kind of a algorithm for how you wanna set it up. And then of course, they'll probably give you these on the exam, but these are kind of some that you should just memorize quickly. Um, and uh, then you'll be able to do these really fast. There's so many of them, just memorize them. Um, PCA L2, yeah, is around 40. I'll leave it at 40. HCO3, I put the 24-ish, right? And then 3.4 is your pH. All right, so let's try this one. Let's use our steps. I'll give you all a second. No scratch paper. Y'all win the longest review ever. So I can't believe y'all are still here. I know, yeah. 55 still going strong. I'm really impressed. That's insane. I'm not even here and I'm here. So I can't, <laughs> I don't even know. How does that even work? We love you guys. I hope you guys know this. 
Oh god. All right, let's let's do this. All right, pH down, right? We would expect it to be 7.4 and um, it's 7.3. So we know there's acidosis, right? Um, what changed? Was it our carbon dioxide or was it our bicarb? bicarb to, uh, which change caused the acidosis? So we know it was respiratory, right? Look at this, it's supposed to be 40, it's 50. So that's a problem. And then we ask ourselves, uh, what um, does this change? Does the CO2 or HCO3 change cause acidosis? Right? So you can see here, um, you, since you're treating carbon dioxide as a, an acid, the patient is obviously hypoventilating or holding on to carbon dioxide. So it's kind of difficult, um, but you can see that the patient is short of breath. For cystic fibrosis, they tend to have a lot of. Um, um, uh, a lot of mucus buildup. So that would kind of make sense. They're, they're not able to properly ventilate, okay? So that's a good way. And then you wanna ask yourself, is there compensation? Well, since the bicarb is in the normal range, you know they're not compensating yet. So probably just a new onset fever, um, the patient just able, isn't able to ventilate properly, okay? So it's acute, no renal compensation. Remember, renal compensation takes a little while. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. So um, in one 60s slide um, where you like um, use the first aid chart, it says like um, when you have compensation, you have like opposite, they go opposite direction. But like in the next slide that we just went through, it's just saying right. like compensation always moves in the same direction. Compet, wait, hold on. Which, hold on. Which, one this one? The he is saying like compensatory response goes ups and downs. Right here, these, these should go in the same, the compensation goes in the same direction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's same. Yeah. Direction. So look at the, um, hold on. Yeah. The mixed disorder is the one that's opposite direction. Yeah. Yeah. But look at the, so you have the immediate hyperventilation, but look at the delayed, it is in the same direction because if you're, if you're increasing acid, you want to increase a base, right? Because you want to offset that thing. So, you know, intuitively speaking, you want to make sure that if one increases, you're increasing the same, you're increasing the other to balance it out. Oh yeah. Makes sense. Well, thank you so much. I just so, want to yeah. so think about it this way. Let's assume that this was a chronic condition, right? It's respiratory acidosis. What would be the compensatory mechanism here? You'd want to increase your bicarb, right? To increase the base. So it would go the same direction. If this PCO2 went up, if, it, if you were able to compensate, your bicarb would go up too. The thing about a mixed disorder is there's no, it's not a compens compensatory response. You're literally having both sets of problems. They're both primary problems, right? So the, the acid problem, it's not only, it's, the, you know, your, your breathing pattern isn't to compensate for the metabolic acidosis. Like the, the actually the aspirin is actually making you uh, breathe that way. Okay. So breathing heavily. Um, um, so, thank you so much. Yeah, no worry. All right, let's do this one. So before you even look at it, this is kind of a good one. You should you should like internally, uh, you know, yay on the exam if they tell you right away that the patient's vomiting, right? Um, so right because you're going to be vomiting up acid, right? So metabolic acidosis. Now I'm sorry, alkalosis, right? Uh, because you're getting rid of acid, but we still want to check it. So let's assume we don't know anything. So step one. We're alkalotic, right? Um, the pH is up, right? So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the primary problem, okay? Is, is going up in carbon dioxide um, a, a alkalotic problem? Like, no, it's not. You're making it more acid, right? You're holding on to the acid. So that's not our problem. By increasing your base here, that's causing the alkalosis, okay? So I think that's an important point here because this next step, you have to determine what's the cause. 
Is increasing your PCO2 causing alkalosis? No, that's causing acidosis. So it seems to me like that's a compensatory response. Whereas this increase in bicarb is actually the cause, okay? So, right, so what are we saying? It's definitely this that's causing it. Bicarb is elevated. Now we have to ask ourselves, now we know it's metabolic acidosis. So is there compensation? Well, you know, we said respiratory compensation is pretty fast. So uh, you would definitely end up hypoventilating. It's an immediate response. So there is compensation, okay? That's how you should do these one, two, three. Um, cross your fingers, they tell you what's going on first. Likely they're not. They're gonna say, they're gonna give you this just like this, and it's gonna be one vomiting, two diarrhea, three anxiety, four dancing on the tables at the club, I don't know. But um, that's what Keyshore does with the brew. <laughs> I'm, 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 all right, Hypo, hyperventilation again, yes. What do Sorry, you mean? Sorry, I'm so a little bit confused. Wait, sorry, are you talking to me yeah. or that? Uh, you go ahead. We could do, we could do the question after, please. What's your question? So essentially, we're saying that the pH is seven point five six, so it's alkalosis, right? Yeah. And then if we look at the PaCO two, we see we see that it's elevated, that it's at fifty um, millimeters mercury, right? Right. So in that case, can we assume it's respiratory, or is that wrong because it's alkalosis and we're hyperventil and we're blowing off and our CO twos are increased? Is that why we can't say it's but, respiratory? But we're not blowing it off. We're holding on to it. And remember, we treat carbon dioxide as an acid. So because we're holding on to it, this is an acid response. Oh, so I keep forgetting ROMS. Yes. Yeah, right. So when you hold on to it, um, it's an acid response. So this is the compens compensatory response. Remember, if, if you're doing some sort of uh, uh, metabolic alkalosis, you're going to have to have uh, an acid response. Um, cool. Yeah, no worries. Hypoventilation. So again, the idea of hypoventilating means you're not breathing as much, so you're holding on to carbon dioxide. If you hold on to carbon dioxide, uh, that's more acid in your body, okay? So that is the way this patient, this patient's been vomiting, throwing up a lot of acid. So the, he's in, uh, he, she, he is in uh, metabolic alkalosis. So the compensatory response is to hypoventilate, hold on to some acid, right? Hold on to that carbon dioxide. So, you no, know, this is respiratory compensation, okay? Because um, you're, you're, the initial problem is metabolic. So the compensation is respiratory, okay? Now, technically, if you wanted to get technical, you do get a renal compensation as well. But in this regards to this exam, if they said, is there compensation? Yes, this would be clearly respiratory compensation, okay? Sorry, I had a, just to follow up on that. So mm -hmm. maybe I just didn't understand it properly, but um, I remember in lecture, she was saying that it was like an immediate response. So is that still considered compensation even though it's an immediate response? Yeah, it's an immediate comp compensate. Like okay. you're your body's immediately feeling like, I'm in a state of alkalosis, right? What can Hi. I do about it? So you start hypoventilating. And the process is you're holding on to carbon dioxide, therefore you're able to convert it to bicarb. Yeah. So it's just a very quick process. Now the other is not exactly that easy because if you have a respiratory problem, you know, the, the initial problem is respiratory, so you can't really correct that. So you have to rely on the kidneys, which takes a couple of days. Yeah. So, All right. um, yeah, yeah. It the timeline doesn't matter. And so anything that happens in response to the change in the pH, that's going to be the compensation. And so just because you immediately start hyperventilating, it doesn't mean that it's not compensatory because it is. And so take the timeline kind of out of your head and just, okay, is this in response to what is happening? or is it the primary cause of what's going on? And so hyperventilation happens immediately. It's a very easy way to, to compensate for an, a metabolic cause. And so it's kind of confusing because you think about compensation as having to you know, go over time, but depending on the system, depending on what it is, it can happen very quickly. But, but rem and remember this, the, the compensation never brings you back to baseline. You're always, you're always trying to approach baseline. You're never gonna get back to equilibrium through the compensation, okay? 
because if you were, then it, it just doesn't work like that. I remember Dr. Mpadi explaining it to us like that. Um, you're always trying to pr approach it, approach that equilibrium, but you're always fighting it, fighting the battle until what you really need to do is address the primary concern. You know, what, what is the initial concern going on? So this just states, um, yeah, immediate response, plus you can also get some sort of renal compensation, but that is gonna take time, okay? Excuse All me? right, what? Excuse me, may I have a quick question? Yeah, of course. Uh, mm, Mm, Lindsay told that uh, the primary, uh, we need to uh, take a look at the primary situation and then think about the con compensatory uh, reaction. But in respiratory, uh, the primary problem would be the, uh, from the lung, it's going to be the uh, carbon dioxide. So uh, respiratory compensation doesn't work here, right? as an immediate uh, as an immediate reaction correct correct yes. yeah That's if true. if you have a respiratory issue metabolic is going to compensate but if you have a metabolic issue respiratory is going to compensate no matter how long the uh, uh, metabolic uh, the, the kidney works as a compensatory uh, as long as it does because yeah. so we're assuming, so a lot of, sometimes you can't compensate metabolically because the metabolic problem is the kidney, right? But let's take like aspirin ingestion, for example, like the kidney works fine. It's the fact that you took all the extra acid, right? So you can compensate with the kidney, but yes, the respiratory compensation is always going to be um, for the, for the metabolic concerns and vice versa. But I just don't want you to get confused because technically the, you know, if the kidney does work properly, it still can try to compensate. But the, the immediate compensation that you're going to be thinking of that, you know, this exam you need to think of is the opposite one. So if it's a metabolic problem, the compensation is respiratory, respiratory, the compensation is renal. Okay. That, I, I just don't, yeah, that for, for now, you're, that's okay. as difficult as it's going to get. Yeah. All right. Uh, we could do these real quick. I don't know how many we have. Can't be that many. Lord. All right. What are we doing? Uh, central diabetes insipidus, no ADH. Where's the receptors? In the chat out loud. Don't care. Let's do this. Anybody. Collecting duck. Yay. <laughs> right. That's primarily. Now, we did say there are technically some ADH receptors on those principal cells in the distal convolute tubule, but we're going collecting duck, right? That's what first aid says. Well, real quick, what are these? We said the clear lumen is the uh, loop of Henle. Anytime you see red blood cells, we're talking about uh, the vasa recta and the dirty lumen, kidney, I mean kidney, <laughs> Keyshore. See the dirty lumen? <laughs> I call them kidney. <laughs> I'm completely lost it. I don't know what's going on. The dirty lumen is the collecting duck. <laughs> Can I call you kidney from now on? <laughs> I'm sorry. What's the question? The yellow. Yes, right? Ascending segment. All our friends are going to get a kick out of that. Right? Permeal to pull to solutes. They don't, they've been here six hours or five hours. They don't think this is as funny as I do. So, <laughs> all right. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate the support. <laughs> All right. Blood in the urine. We also just took an exam, so yeah. we still are not <laughs> mentally here, just to let you guys know. All right. Um, biopsy of the bladder, cancer, which one? Okay. So this is more of a not right now problem, right? Why are we doing this? Uh, I guess, okay. Well, yeah, the, the renal drainage, internal iliac, I'll probably get into this more later, but remember internal systems going to the internal iliac primarily. Um, this seems like so much ER. All of this stuff is running that. together for me. All right, we talked about this one, constricts the E. Yeah, that's a good bladder external, prostate internal. Good, yeah. Um, remember, if we constrict the efferent arterial, we're pushing blood into the glomerulus, right? That's the only route we're going to go. Um, and um, 
Um, so you're going to increase your GFR, right? Decrease renal plasma flow because you're decreasing the overall flow by decreasing the efferent arterial. But if we put GFR over renal plasma flow, you're going to increase your filtration fraction. All right, barrier, repel negative charges, heparin sulfate, I'm sure. I think Lindsay wrote these questions. Lindsay? I didn't. Jesus, Lindsay. Write these questions. What? Well, heparin sure. Uh, <laughs> history of depression, one pre suicide. Okay, here's a good one. All right, here's a good yeah, one. Yeah, if there's a lot of abbreviations, you know I wrote the question. She was a scribe, if y'all didn't know, she'll tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> scribe right. life hashtag. <laughs> so first step, 7.55, alkalosis. Which one's the problem? Well, bicarb's okay. PCO2 is down, right? You're breathing out too much. So respiratory, anybody? Respiratory problem? Blowing it out, alkalosis? Yes, good. Respiratory alkalosis. Are we compensating? No, we are not. All right, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, a questionable restaurant. Don't eat there. All right. Would you observe in the patient? History That's of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Yes. <laughs> mm. Yes. Right, isoosmotic, you're getting rid of a lot of extra fluids, you're losing electrolytes too, right? So our graph would kind of just be condensed. 62 year old male, uncontrolled hypertension, shortness of breath, uh, two plus edema and pulmonary. Bilateral edema. low extremity, Nobody chest x-ray. No, we know. <laughs> Give him furosemide. Furosemide is a loop diuretic. What I is think the, what you're hearing work? is like, delusional at this point not it like we're past exhaustion it's delusional at this we're going to cut this we're going to cut this part out of the recording so don't worry about it um <laughs> so frosamide works on the loop loop is remember we said in a in the ncck ncck <laughs> transporter Mag i forgot about my mango monster all right pct what do we say <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all got jokes. All right, what do we want to grab first? Bring the glucose back, always. And that's it, people. It's been real. Good we luck. We love on your you guys. Exam. We really, really do. Good we'll luck on you. your exam. We Thank will you see y'all in Grenada and have an yeah. adult beverage together. <laughs> no, thank you so thank much. Thank you guys so much. I remind you guys a lot of drinks when we're on the island together. That <laughs> sounds good to me. <laughs> Brady, you want me to get you a mango monster? I'll take one, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Wherever man. you find us, as long. <laughs> yeah. Get that man a beer. He had too many last night, is the thing. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, I'm glad we showed up. <laughs>